Good morning and welcome to the House Environment and Energy Committee. This morning, we're going to continue taking testimony on H687. And we are going to be talking about future land use mapping with our regional planning commissioners. Welcome back, Catherine Dimitrick. Thank you very much for having me, Chair. Okay. Um, first, before I jump into future land use, I just wanted to highlight a question that came up yesterday. I see two of the questioners were not here, so maybe I'll save that. <laughs> um, you can go ahead. We can pass it on. Okay, sure. So we were thinking about the question that was raised yesterday about the Tier 1B area and our the Regional Planning Commission recommendation that upon acceptance of our maps, that would be automatic and recognize the concerns that were raised about that. And so we wanted to suggest two ideas. Um, the first being that since it would be a jurisdictional trigger, one of the triggers for that jurisdictional change would be a requirement that the municipality has zoning and subdivision regulations. And that's something that's already tracked by the Natural Resources Board because it impacts the commercial jurisdictional trigger for the size one acre versus 10 acre. So that is a system that's already in place to track. So that would be easy. And the second piece of that is that we would like, we would suggest adding to our description in the statutory language for the 1B areas, a requirement that the area either has water or sewer or the soil capability to do the more community scale systems. Thank you for that. You're welcome. So, so I want to let you know that we did think about that and want to offer a couple of recommendations. And when we provide written testimony, we'll provide some language. Thank you. So I just want to take a few minutes today. Uh, we're talking a lot about future land use. And I just want to take a few minutes today to talk about what regional planning commissions currently do and how that might change, just to ground that conversation a little bit more. And what I've had before you and showing you is <clears throat> the current regional plan for Franklin and Grand Isle County, so the Northwest Regional Plan. All regional planning commissions have a proposed land use section of their regional plans and have a map that shows what we envision is the appropriate future development patterns for conservation patterns for those lands. So for example, currently the re we already map villages and hamlets in what we consider our regional scale and sub-regional scale growth areas. And our regional plans also all include a description of what those areas mean and what the goals are for those areas. These plans are developed through a collaborative process with our municipalities, with other key stakeholders. We have series of public meetings. We work directly with our communities. We use information from our communities to build these maps as well as outside information from um, resource areas and other uh, important features. So it's really a collaborative process that we already do and is already reflected in our regional plans. And now I wanted to show you an example of how that might change under this new uh, scheme that we are recommending. <laughs> so this is a super rough draft of what a future land use map might look like under these recommendations. And what I wanted to highlight to you is really the scale of the different areas as opposed to the specific lines. So if you look at the red areas, the downtown and village centers, you'll see them scattered about the region in St. Albans City, Fairfax, Richford, et cetera. Those are the currently designated downtowns and villages that already exist through our state designation program. When you look at this map and see the light pink areas and the purple areas, those are what we're proposing as the planned growth areas. So combined together, if you compare those to tier 1A and tier 1B, I want to just talk a minute about what that would mean. So the downtown areas, those in red, plus the pink planned growth areas, those would be the places that we would consider eligible for the tier 1A exemptions. So if a municipality demonstrates they have all those things in place, then they would be able to achieve the tier 1A designation. The village centers and the village areas shown in purple are more the areas that might be eligible for the tier 1B. Did you provide this to our, our community system? I will now, <laughs> yes. It would be helpful if we could look at it a little closer up. Mm -hmm. 
and I'll just zoom in on one community to give you an example. So this is the community of Richford, which is a community that has the unfortunate opportunity to hit all of the negative indicators for poverty, income, unemployment, um, and a host of other social indicators. They currently have a designated village, which is the red area shown on the map. And the pink area that we've shown here is the area that really encompasses their traditional walkable downtown, including neighborhoods, opportunities for redevelopment. And Richford is one of those places that has a ton of opportunities for redevelopment. And we think that something like this process that we're recommending would really help to jumpstart that. Um, so I just wanted to highlight Richard as one example. Representative Sebelia. Yeah, Catherine, just a quick question on the Richford. Oh, sure. It's thing that I worry about. How will we, how, <clears throat> so flood. Mm -hmm. So how can we understand that when we're looking at these maps? And by right. the way, I love seeing these maps. I like to see one for the whole state. Kind of, so. so I'm glad you asked about that um, because this was a quick mapping exercise. We did not go through the process of like taking out the, like a river corridor area or a, a special flood hazard area that should not be in this tier 1B area. We didn't go through that exercise yet, but um, it is something that I think we will definitely need to take into account because we don't want to encourage development in the very places we're trying to protect from development by changing the reg regulatory standards. So, so as we're doing this mapping, as communities are learning about their their towns, like how will that come into this? So, it, through the arc, I think. One of the things that this process will bring is a great opportunity to have more of those focused discussions locally. So as we're trying to draw these boundaries, really working with the community so they understand more where their river corridors are, where their vulnerable places are, that's going to be a great opportunity to do that at the same time. So river corridors are critical resource areas? Um, I think so. They are, yes, and they are regulated. Um, a lot of towns do regulate them at least at a minimum standard. So is that how we're going to see those showing up on the map? I think that's an open question. And that's something that's a legislative policy decision as whether those should be shown on a map now or regulated in a different way, which is being discussed by other committees elsewhere in the building. <laughs> it seems like it's really important for the mapping now. Well, I think separate from whether we, um, how we might contemplate changing how we regulate development in a river corridor, I think that communities have that data available to them now and they would use it for, I think, what you're talking about, which is identifying areas that are not flood prone for their communities to grow into. Mm -hmm. So that would be, I imagine, front and center of pretty much every Vermont community right now in how they're going to work with their regional commissions on these future land use maps. And I think that you raise a really good point. When you look at a community like Richford that has water and sewer um, that really wants to grow differently, the designated area, the red area on this map is right along the river. I mean, it is it is ripe for flooding and danger, but if, if you, look at the pink area that's been drawn here, that is really great opportunities for redevelopment, for future residential growth, for future, you know, lighter scale commercial that will help support the, the traditional downtown in a way that's positive and more flood resilient for the future. So can you just remind us while we're zoomed in what your legend is? The, the pink, the red is the current down, downtown. Mm -hmm. Can you stay zoomed in? It's yes. really helpful for us. Like. <laughs> so the red is the current downtown. The pink outside of that would be that area that's eligible for either 1A or 1B, depending on what the community does for their local regulations. And then the kind of rusty orange color is what we've recommended in our future land use study as the transitional zone. So an area that's currently in some strip development pattern that we hope really can transition into a more um, compact, dense development pattern. Thank you. 
Welcome for civilian. Yeah, civilian. So it, it would just be helpful to me, um, Catherine, to see this, if you could, I would like to look at this map for Richford and the flood map for Richford. If your office could provide that. And I don't know if that's something for the committee, but I would definitely like to see that. Yeah, I think we can do that. We have a great AmeriCorps person who's made these maps for me, who's excited to use their GIS skills. <laughs> so that was what I had for you today. Just wanted to present that. Thank you. Uh, Charlie Baker, uh, for the record, uh, Executive Director of the Chinna County Regional Planning Commission. I am not going to offer you too much more because I feel like we've uh, talked a lot at you uh, in the last couple of weeks. Um, the only thing I think I'll add to what Catherine said um, is she focused more on the, the areas uh, in, like Tier 1. Um, so if I could spend a minute on Tier 3. Um, we would really appreciate getting as much uh, direction from the legislature and statute as possible about what should be in tier three. Um, so, you know, we would like to get started on this work with our communities and the public um, soon. And uh, I think I, have a, I think we have a concern about uh, it taking a long time uh, if we have uh, a process with A&R that takes some, you know, even if it's defined in statute to take a year or two, uh, you know, we've had some experiences that have taken a lot longer than that. Um, so more direction and statute would be just helpful to us in doing our work. Um, and also, I think for the NRB, uh, after the factors are reviewing our plans and approving our plans, like, are we uh, consistent with statute? So, um, and we are uh, kind of taking some of the things that are on the table right now and trying to also look at, at mapping for tier three and what that looks like. So uh, we'll, uh, I think, be prepared probably next week to uh, have some more detailed conversation if you're interested in that conversation. We are. That would be great. Thank you. Um, can I ask, would, you, would it be, would you be able to though walk us through your definitions of the different categories in the future land use maps right now? I mean, I feel like we may have questions for you and clarifications before we try to put them work them into our bill? Yeah. Um, sorry, I was flipping to that page uh, from what I sent you. Um, so, um, this is the document you gave us yesterday. I think, was that shared yesterday? I, I mentioned it yesterday. Um, I believe so. It was given to me and shared. Yeah. Um, so, I think from the, <laughs> the document that we shared last Friday, and we, we will also follow up. I know we owe you comments, a map, and we'll, we'll also attach this uh, draft statutory language. It's 34 pages of- uh, That sounds mm -hmm. correct. That's right. right. So it is under, I, I found it under Charlie's name under witnesses members. Yeah, that's okay. not today, which I did put on today's mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, the land use areas, uh, downtown village centers, um, these are, are really um, pretty consistent uh, with the current designations for those centers. Um, Can you tell us what page they're on? Oh, I'm sorry, page 19. They start on. Um, and this this uh, description is actually taken, taken right from the downtown and village center designation language that's currently in statute. Uh, no, you're not a lawyer, but I'm going to ask you to just read it, if you don't mind. Just sure. <laughs> the, uh, these areas are the vibrant mixed-use centers, bringing together community economic activity and civic assets. Includes hamlets, villages, new town centers, and large, larger downtowns seeking benefits under the state designation program. I'm noting we should strike hamlets, probably. Um, the downtown village centers are the central business and civic centers within planned growth areas, village areas, or may stand alone. So, and that's just kind of acknowledging we have some village centers that are, that's pretty much all that's there. There isn't a lot of residential development uh, outside the designated village center. There's some very small village centers in the state right now that are, I think we have 250. A lot, yeah. yeah. So there's some small ones. There's still probably some potential for more, um, but that's what that is. Members have questions. I'm hoping that if you 
are uh, able to engage um, on this level right now would be helpful because we're contemplating putting these into our bill. Representative Tory. I have a question about Hamlets. Yes. Um, I'm of one of the towns in my district that has some Hamlets and they are, um, you know, definitely not flood prone and they have historic settlement and they may have the, the soils and they may be, I don't know what visioning process is ahead for that community, but yeah. If a hamlet was identified as in an area that made sense to be a growth area, mm -hmm. does the fact that it's a hamlet handicap it in any way? No, I think, and thanks for asking that question. Um, and we actually have another land use category strictly for hamlets, um, kind of noting, and the reason for that is noting that they um, haven't yet asked or done the work to become a designated village center. Mm -hmm. And so, Within the, all of this is the notion that a community can move up so they can move from a hamlet to a village to, you know, put in infrastructure to become a planned growth area and, and maybe, you know, they wanted to, maybe they could even become a downtown, right? Um, so there is this notion that um, towns can grow and evolve. Um, and um, I think if, if uh, you uh, talk with the DHCD staff as they're talking about the designation program and and what they're recommending for statutory changes. They're talking a lot about a ladder the community can climb. The more they do, the more benefits they get. Mm -hmm. um, same, there's a same philosophy in here. And it's just also just organically our communities evolved like that, right? Like they started off small, they grew. Uh, and then, so there's always the possibility as we go through the iterations of this, that communities could move up or, or down, uh, you know, if, if for whatever reason that might happen. Uh, but sorry, that's a pretty negative thought. Oh. Um, members, uh, I found this under, if you go under witness on our webpage and just look up Charlie's name, it's under yesterday's date. It is live today and as well. Will now. has just posted it under Charlie's name. Yeah. So, and look, we are on page 19. Yeah. Under witness. So, item. Now you can go to today's date, Representative. Oh. Okay. Page 19. Yeah. Um, so that was item A, downtown village centers. Um, and that's really trying to line up with the designation program for those centers. Uh, item B, and is, is, is the more complicated plan growth area. I don't know, I almost feel like saving that for last because we've talked about that the most so far, but, but I'll kind of review. Plan growth area includes the dense existing settlement and future growth areas with the highest concentrations of population, housing, and employment in each region and town as appropriate. They include a mix of commercial, residential, civic, or cultural sites with active streetscapes supported by land development regulations, public water and or wastewater, and multimodal transportation systems. These areas include historic or new town centers, downtowns, and village centers. These areas should substantially meet the following criteria. Mm -hmm. And then we have a list of criteria that goes on to the next page, but the bottom of this page, uh, that they have a... a uh, adopted an approved plan through the, uh, and there's re statutory references there, um, that the areas within walking distance or of municipalities or adjacent municipalities, downtown village center, new town center or growth center, that it excludes, and Representative Sebelia, this is to your point, the flood hazard fluvial erosion area, um, except, and this is where we're trying to kind of comport with existing policy, except those areas that have pre-existing development, areas that are suitable for infill. Uh, and again, there's a reference to the uh, flood has very and river corridor rule uh, from A&R. So <clears throat> I have a specific example in my uh, in mind, which is town of Wilmington, which is very densely settled, um, lost, drowned multiple times, uh, tropical storm, I mean, devastated. Yeah. Uh, so how does that, like, how are we treating that town in uh, this situation? So it's a down, it is a designated downtown, does have zoning, yep. um, and it's got a river that runs right through the middle. Right. So I think as we have been thinking about this, um, we don't want to see development in that hazard zone, right? And so we would do a planned growth area that excludes the hazard area. So that might mean like uh, maybe working with the town, maybe there's some opportunity to kind of grow up slope a little bit into a safer area. And that's what we would want to identify because we want to try to encourage 
that behavior going forward. And so the existing town, yep. which is a, an existing designated area, yep. would still remain exempt or no? Or, or would be able to be exempt or no? Um, yeah, if, if that whole growth area, I think um, you're in the point of policy debate. I think so the, you, look, going, you look like you don't understand. Like, no, I understand, I understand the question. Asking. So I don't, no, I understand I'm the question. Really trying to struggle through this. I'm, <laughs> so, and I'm struggling with the response, not, not the question, right. because that is the subject of policy debate in this building right now, right? It's like, how do we treat those areas <laughs> in the hazard zones? There's a lot of existing development there. Are we, you know, how is that going to be treated? How is it going to be regulated? Is it, um, so from a planning perspective, we're going to be saying, you know, don't, don't do more stuff there. Like, let's not compound the problems we already have. Um, how that's, you know, legally protected or regulated uh, to improve the situation there is not yet clear to me. Um, you know, we, we've talked uh, in, <clears throat> particularly in Senate Natural Resources about uh, the flood hazard river corridor uh, bills S-213 um, that would kind of ramp up the regulatory regime that the state has for those areas. Uh, that's one possibility. Does it become jurisdictional for Act 250? And that's part of the regulatory system to review what happens there in a, you know, in a more consistent statewide manner. Um, so I'm sorry, I, I, I really do understand the issue and you don't want to compound the problem. I think exactly how we do that as a state is not perfectly clear right now. I would agree with you. And I would also say that I think these are incredibly emotional conversations in these communities. Yeah. Well, and it's, and yeah. I think a public engagement. Oh, absolutely. This is very important. And I'm not seeing. Yeah, no, public engagement is, is the foundation of our planning work, to be honest. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, and, and these are very emotional uh conversations in each community was we're talking about flood, flood damages um, and, you know, how to evolve in a positive and healthy way for that community is going to be support to the conversation. And that work has not happened, right? I mean, we're not coming here saying all that work is, we're <clears throat> looking for statutory language to tell us to go do that work. Uh, so that's really what we're talking about here. Well, and just to explain my reaction. So yesterday, yeah. Madam Chair, we heard multiple witnesses say, you have to do this firmly. You have to do it quickly. You have to, you know, really bring the hammer down. And I may agree with all of that. But again, we have to get in front of these conversations with our communities. Yeah. And I don't see that on the table right now. Um, I'm sorry that we're not uh, articulating that. I mean, it's not to you, Charlie. No, no, no. In general, I no. am not seeing that on the table right now. It's not to the RPCs. I apologize. No, it's it, corrected. We're going to own a lot of that. Yeah. We work with our communities every day. Um, sometimes we're helping them, you know, uh, evaluate their flood regulations, you know, and there are really tough conversations. Um, you know, I think we've all been through flood damage situations and, you know, the recovery is, is hard. And what does the long term look like? Um, and, you know, FEMA doesn't always help us because they're kind of like doing the short-term fix and not the long-term fix. Right. And I think that's kind of the conversation we're having in the building is how do we get to a healthier long-term place and still uh, really value those communities and the investments that we have there and, you know, people's roots, or, you know, their families are there. Um, so I totally get the emotion. Uh, will, those conversations do need to happen. Um, and, and I don't know if there's a way for us to articulate because I think we do feel a great sense of responsibility of having those conversations about what should happen in our communities, um, with our communities, with our residents. Um, if there's a way that we should articulate, I guess we, we kind of like know that and we just expect it. Like we're going to have, I don't know how many, we could have a thousand meetings before we get to our regional plan. Um, I hope I'm exaggerating, but, but it could be <laughs> hundreds. And I don't know that I'm exaggerating and saying a hundred. Um, meetings to really kind of work through these issues with our community so that we fully expect that that is the work in the next one two three years uh, to have these conversations yeah I, I mean you all are the front line on that and i understand that and you're doing that now but we're also talking about historic changes here yes. yeah. historic yeah. 
And so, uh, you know, we should not all move along as if this is just kind of run of the mill. Uh, we need to talk to Vermonters about this and we need to make sure that you all have a good mandate and good tools to have robust conversations with our communities. Yeah. And, and the specifics of how those area, how we become more thoughtful about protecting those areas are really important. You know, uh, you know, flood regulations can allow, you know, just elevating a building or doing some flood proofing, you know, you know, where there, there's gray area in between there. This is not a black and white conversation. Um, it's easy to prevent people from going into a floodplain in a new new area. Not so easy to do the redevelopment or the reinvestment to make uh, an area more flood. <coughs> uh, so. Thank you. Representative Smith. Thank you. Uh, uh, is this regional plan update been sent to David Snedeker and NBDA? Um, that's a good question. Uh, I just sent this out last Friday. I and I've been sending too many emails, and I'm a little overloaded, so I'm not mm -hmm. sure if I send it to all you. Agencies. Would you please send that to him? Uh, yeah. Uh, if I, <clears throat> already, I, I, I value his his opinion on things, and I'd like to talk with him. And he's back from vacation, so yeah. And this is, but this is really reflecting. Um, this is a statutory version of the study that we did, so he has seen the concepts here. Okay. Okay. Good. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you, Thank you. Morris. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Charlie, thank you for mentioning uh, going up in, in uh, the flood areas. Uh, there's a community uh, in, down around my district, uh, Ludlow, which had flooding <clears throat> along the main street that had uh, that wiped out the mobile home park and the businesses uh, on this end and uh, the hotels and restaurants on this end. But in the middle is a set of condos and they're elevated. Yeah. And so they, they don't they aren't affected by that flooding. So there are ways mm -hmm. to, and that's where the local process needs to come in to understand those areas. And, and I think that's what you're trying to allude to. Yeah, and um, and honestly, in, in other conversations, particularly around 213, I think we're also having more conversations about uh, you know, flooding isn't all local. It's not a local issue. It's a, it's a watershed issue, right? <laughs> watershed moment. <laughs> but um, you know, so I think there's going to be a lot of situations where we need to look further upstream. Are there flood mitigation things? Can we get uh, more functioning floodplains? Uh, upstream of our village centers uh, to really protect them. Uh, so there's a lot more conversation that does need to happen in that area. Yeah. Um, uh, okay, so that was number three of the criteria for, for a planned growth area was a flood hazard. Um, number four uh, was, is that the plan indicates this area is entire, in, intended for higher density residential mixed use development. So we wanna make sure they've done the planning work within the town. Number five, uh, the area provides for housing that meets the diversity of social income groups. That's pretty related to, oh, sorry, question. Representative Logan, it's okay. Um, for number five, um, would you be open to making that a little bit more prescriptive? Um, interested in seeing how we could um, bring over a concept that is something like a priority housing project um, yeah. type of requirement into planned growth. Yeah, and I, I do think that's what we mean by diversity of right. social and income groups. Right, uh, this leaves it really broad, so that yeah. would potentially give municipalities, you know, a very uh, wide range, you know, a, a way to interpret that um, locally, but I, I think I would be more comfortable if there was a little bit more teeth. That's a, a really good point. And, um, and actually in rereading this, I kind of wish that it said um, also addresses the housing targets, which um, mm -hmm. the HOME Act is requiring us to do. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and that's also for a diversity of housing, not, you know, not just high end or not just low end. Yeah. Um, and so um, there, there, there's, that language could definitely be uh, strengthened. Thank you. I, I am already working on something, yeah. Um, but um, but yeah, I'm very interested in that particular piece. Us too. Yeah, I think that's it. Um, Representative Logan's bringing up a really important point around right now in these um, neighborhood development areas. For example, we prioritize priority housing projects 
which are for low and moderate income housing. And how can we make sure that these areas continue to require that, essentially, and that it not just result in market rate housing being built? And maybe you're both talking about two different ends of the same thing when you're talking about the housing inventory, which we have asked yesterday, Representative Sebelia asked that it be broken down by requirements within different income categories, not just we need 6,800 units, but what types of units? And then making sure that we continue to um, build that housing in these places. Yeah, and we didn't get specific. I, think, I do think that's another uh, you know, policy question that needs to get resolved. You know, I think there's an argument for doing, you know, PHPs ought to be required. Uh, you know, for you to get the exemption, maybe one way to go about it. I mean, and the PHP I think requires 20% affordable. Mm -hmm. So, you know, by kind of by definition, it's a mixed income uh, project. I mean, some of them may have more than 20% affordable, um, but that is interesting. And um, I think the reason we didn't go there is wanting to just leave the community the flexibility that it may be, there may be a mix of things happening there may be a market, and then there may be a fully affordable project, and then there may be a priority housing project that has a mix. Um, so yeah, we're trying to get to the same result, uh, but not quite sure how much should be mandated. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, number uh, <clears throat> six is uh, just that we have, um, they're doing infrastructure on the transportation, on the streets that meet the complete streets requirements that are other, already in statute. Um, and then seven is kind of the anti-sprawl language. And we took this from the existing NDA and uh, smart growth uh, language that's in statute. So this is kind of a, a condensing of that. Um, so we're talking about um, it's not characterized by scattered development outside the centers. Um, it doesn't limit transportation options. In other words, it's not just auto-centric. Um, it uh, doesn't fragment farm or forest land, and it's not serviced by municipal infrastructure. Uh, and then uh, the last one is, and it's not uh, just strip development along the road. So that was um, that was the end of the planned growth area. And again, we're thinking those are the areas that are would be eligible for one A, uh, and if they don't meet the one A criteria, they would be one B. Um, Village areas, yeah, I'm supposed to be elsewhere, but uh, it's okay. Um, the village areas, um, we talked a little bit about yesterday. Uh, this, so this is a traditional settlement area or a proposed new settlement area, typically comprised of a cohesive mix of residential, civic, religious, commercial, and mixed use buildings arranged along Main Street and intersecting streets that are in, within walking distance for residents who live within and surrounding the core. Um, that definition again is taken kind of cur from current statute about the uh, village areas uh, and it may and this is the what Catherine was just referencing this is the key sentence about it we said may or may not have one of the following i think we're kind of evolving to like no you need to have some way to uh, deal with wastewater and you need to have some level of development regulations um, again you know i think we were erring on trying to be more inclusive so that more towns could uh, participate in the 1B option, uh, which is the kind of conversation that was happening at the NRB table, uh, study table there. Um, but, you know, if it needs to move a little bit, understand. Um, and they provide some opportunity for infill development or new development areas where the village can grow and be flood resilient. Um, these areas include existing village center and some of the designations, uh, but this area is larger than the village center. So again, we're trying to the village centers focus on the commercial core. The village area would bring in the residential that are uh, adjacent to that core. Um, Catherine uh, just mentioned this. This, uh, and now we're kind of moving out of tier one to tier two, as you think about the NRB recommendations. The transition infill areas. So, do um, you want me to read this or just talk more general? Do you want me to read? <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> Uh, so this area includes uh, existing or planned commercial office, mixed use development or residential uses, either adjacent to a planned growth area or village area, or a new standalone transition area that is uh, served by or planned for water and wastewater. 
The intent of this land use category is to transform these areas into higher density mixed use settlements or residential neighborhoods through infill and redevelopment or new development. New commercial strip auto oriented development is not allowed as to prevent negatively impacting the economic vitality of the commercial areas in the adjacent or nearby planned growth or village area. This area could also include adjacent greenfield safer from flooding and planned for future growth. Um, and in this area, we're really trying to say they haven't necessarily done the bylaw work yet, but we're identifying there's an opportunity in this area for them to evolve and get denser in this part of town. Uh, so they have some infrastructure, but they really haven't done the bylaw work. Uh, item E. <clears throat> you say they haven't done the bylaw work. These are towns that have bylaws. So what does that mean? Um, not all our villages have bylaws. I guess when I think about the transition infill area, I think of communities that are served by water and sewer. Yeah, these so there's a lot of these areas that would not be. Oh. So this is our more rural villages that may not have the infrastructure. Um, and they may have, uh, and they may have bylaws, but it may be very old bylaws. It's into a planned growth area for. Yeah. Yeah, definitely the planned growth area. You're, I bet you're probably right. The village area ones. So where we have strip development, you know, leading into a, a village, they may or may not have bylaws. They may or may not have the infrastructure. Okay, so this is. A kind of a, a two pronged um, land use category where it could be a place where um, historic zoning may have allowed for a more linear auto focus. And they're trying to kind of correct it back to um, a more walkable, accessible area, but it also could be a place that communities are hoping to grow into. Right. Okay, I thought that was in more of the previous two categories also. If, if they've done the bylaw work, it probably would be in the upper two categories. If they haven't really um, done, I'm gonna use the word good and I'm <laughs> to mean a lot of stuff. Well, um, well. If they haven't done updated bylaws that kind of like are trying to do a mix of uses and make it more walkable. So like they have bylaws that still are encouraging strip development or larger lot development. This is where we would kind of say, hey, this area could be, could look different if you updated your bylaws, but we're kind of flagging it because it's an opportunity that maybe the town's been talking about growing into. And it's kind of, I think we mean kind of literally, we're probably in a transitional conversation with the town, um, you know, or the town is in a conversation with themselves about how do they want to treat that, but they haven't made the final decisions yet. If they did make the decisions, I agree with you, then we, it would move up. Uh, so, and this, we were just trying to, I think, capture, we're gonna have some towns that haven't done the work yet, and but there's an opportunity here. Thank you, Representative Lovey. Thanks, Chair. Is it inappropriate to ask an example? I'm just having, I'm having a hard time envisioning like a specific community that fits in the uh, Thank you, it's it's an opportunity. That poster oh. child is in South Burlington? I was going to go to Shelburne, but maybe it's the additional. Actually, I'm talking about both of them yeah. because um, so if you're familiar at all with Shelburne Road, Route Seven, right, coming south from between Burlington and the village of Shelburne, right, which I'm sure <laughs> years ago was beautiful farm field and has been, you know, car dealerships and you know gas stations and fast food restaurants, right? Um, in um, South Burlington. I would probably argue that they might be part of a planned growth area. They've updated their zoning. They have the infrastructure. They're trying to, you'll see there's, there's been change there. Apartment buildings are coming closer to the street. Uh, there's mixed use projects. Um, so they're probably a good example of community that did, that did the work and can move up. Shelburne uh, has tried to do the work a little bit, uh, but their zoning right now between Shelburne Village and South Burlington probably is, in the process and needs to be updated. Um, so they probably would be a transition area right now. Um, and if they did get all their zoning updated, they do have water and sewer, they're on a transit mm -hmm. route. Um, and so they could probably get there, but right now we would probably say, you're a transition right now, 
until you've done the work, then you move up. Is that, is that helpful? Sorry, Shelburne, South Burlington. <laughs> well, I guess not sorry to South Burlington. Sorry, Shelburne. Um, hopefully that doesn't cost me later. Um, uh, pay your, please pay your dues. Um, <laughs> section E, so now we start to get a little, um, uh, or these are still kind of in tier two, uh, resource-based recreation, uh, a number of regions uh, kind of call out as special areas, the ski areas, and this kind of started as that. Um, and then as we were talking about it, we were like, eh, there could be some other uh, areas, um, you know, maybe uh, uh, space. Jason. Jason Harbor, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, we've definitely been too too many meetings together, uh, but Basin Harbor is probably another one of these where you know they've they've got their wastewater and they've got a bunch of units and uh, right there right, um, so that's what that is. Um, but they do have infrastructure, jobs, housing to support those recreational activities. Uh, item F, uh, enterprise. So these are locations of high economic activity and employment which are not adjacent to planned growth areas. Uh, they include industrial parks, uh, areas of natural resource extraction, gravel pits like that, um, and other commercial uses which involve larger land areas. Enterprise areas typically have ready access to water supply, sewage disposal, electricity, and freight transportation networks. And this was just acknowledging, as we looked at the regional plans around the state, there were some of these uh, industrial parks and things that are not really tied closely into a village or, or uh, center. So, acknowledging this. So, these are all in tier proposed to be in tier two. Yeah. And the way we were thinking about experience uh, for uh, development in an industrial park today versus if we pass this and it's in a tier two, would be what? Um, what does it change? We didn't, when we were writing this, we didn't think there was going to be much change in tier two, uh, but I don't know, probably Sabina can answer that better than I can. Okay. That's great. Um, it's back to be greater. She could. Yeah. And I think important to note that we do have a lot of um, industrial and business parks that are kind of part of the community fabric. Those would be probably in the planned growth area, like they're part of uh, that tier one area. So this is really the standalone places that are just not connected to the fabric of the community. Um, so in item G, we get to that uh, Hamlet uh, places, uh, the small historic clusters of homes and perhaps a school, a church store, or other public building not planned for significant growth uh, without public water or wastewater, mostly focused along one or two roads. Um, and you know, as we were talking about, some of them are so small, some of the uh, RPCs are saying, well, we might just note it as a point because the point is probably going to be bigger than the geography when we particularly for the kingdom <laughs> they were kind of like uh that's how they're kind of i expect they pro will probably treat these places um and others i was, I was may do the same um uh, any questions on that and again this was kind of just wanting to acknowledge those kind of little centers of the community that again could could grow could evolve into and move up the scale into village um and then the last three, we really get into, we started off with kind of the word rural in all of these very purposefully. Um, and, but we decided to break it out into three categories of rural. Um, some of the regions are breaking it out. Some of us just have a blanket rural zone now. Um, the rural general um, is, we're trying to promote the traditional working landscape and natural area features. But it does allow for low density residential and sometimes limited commercial that is compatible with productive lands and natural areas. This could also include an area that a municipality is planning to make more rural than it is currently. Um, and uh, yeah, remember some conversation about that, like if a community wants to actually kind of de-densify an area, how would they indicate that and say, oh, you want to be rural. We're talking about the future here, not necessarily what is, but what is your plan for the area? Item A is getting more into those uh, productive lands, the agriculture, forestry, the blocks of forest and farmland, the sustained resource industries provide critical wildlife habitat, movement and outdoor recreation, flood storage, aquifer recharge, scenic beauty, and contribute to economic well being, quality of life. Uh, development in these areas should be carefully managed to promote the working landscape and rural economy and address regional goals while protecting the agriculture and 
forest resource value. Um, and there's just a note um, in 2016, I think you passed Act 171, which was you know, about having us do more uh, forestry planning in our uh, town and regional plans. So this is just kind of a connection. This is kind of the area where uh, some of that mapping would probably live in that area. And then, um, and there could definitely, there's some overlapping here. Uh, we wanted to uh, have a, a rural conservation area that is intended to be conserved often with regulations or state or nonprofit purchase of property rights, limiting development, fragmentation, and diversion in order to maintain ecological health and scenic beauty. These lands have significant ecological value and require special protection due to their uniqueness, fragility, or ecological importance. They may include protected lands, areas with specific features like steep slopes or endangered species, wetlands, flood hazard areas, and shoreline protection areas. And you'll see note in highlight that was a start to a list, but um, we're not sure that it really is the list, but um, we really would like um, to get some clear direction here. Um, and uh, these areas are intended to remain largely undeveloped for the benefit of future generations. Um, some portion of managed forest land will likely fall into this category. So kind of acknowledging, you know, there's a little, I don't know, just we'll, we'll need to get some clarity about, you know, what goes into the forest versus the conservation. Um, and, uh, and it's also help intended to help meet the requirements of Act 71. And, um, I think 10 VSA 89, maybe the, uh, the 30 by 30, 50 by 50, uh, section of statute that you passed pretty recently. So, um, you know, we're kind of anticipating that work may also inform this. Um, so be a good, sorry. Representative Unger. Also be a good place to plug in reference to the law conservation. Consistency. Yeah, and that may be that may be the direction that you kind of, uh, give here. Um, so these are the tier three. Areas. Tier three. Thank you. I was, that's going to mention that. But yeah, when we've been thinking about this, we we're like, okay, if this is where the tier three, you know, uh, extra jurisdiction would come in through Act Two Fifty. Uh, Can I? Yes. So, uh, just a, a flag I want to. And here's I'm looking at the language on this uh, and thinking about um, people who have this land now. Um, the language, uh, so for instance, the, the language in I is helpful. It's kind of descriptive about what it what the land is and why it's important. Um, so in, in J, um, include areas intended to be conserved. So that, you know, <clears throat> that language doesn't quite sit right with me. It feels, um, feels not respectful of the people that may be on that land and uh, not as helpful as the language before in terms of describing its importance. So I don't have any suggestions. I just want to note that I'm seeing that and thinking about that. Yeah. No, I think that's, uh, that is a really good thing to think about. I think we were- it's intent. Like it says intended to be conserved, uh, you know? So it may not be the property owner's intent to have that conserved, uh, even though, so we have to help kind of explain the why here. Yeah, and I think, uh, our thinking about this was trying to uh, be supportive of wherever the the thirty by thirty, fifty by fifty conversation goes. Like we know there's going to be some some mapping or some criteria that comes out of that. We're trying to line up with that, so we're we are having clear conversations with property owners. I, so I have a suggestion actually, yeah. which may not work, but something instead like <clears throat> important to be considered for mm -hmm. conservation. Yeah or something like that, which feels more helpful to a property owner as opposed to, I don't intend for that. Yeah. And so. And, 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 yeah, and, and obviously when we use the word intent in statute, that's the state's, the legislature's intent, right? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, um, that's the end of the future language. Yeah, Charlie, thank you for taking the time to walk us through that yeah. and help us understand. We'll probably have further questions as we work it in. But... Sorry to take so much time. No, 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 we had time for you. And that was the intention of this morning. Uh, members, we're going to.
take a quick break until 10 and then um, start up again with our next scheduled witnesses. We're going to reconvene our hearing and welcome Janet Hurley via Zoom. Welcome. Representative Sheldon and members of the committee, thank you for inviting me to testify today on H-687 as introduced. I come to this testimony with over 15 years experience as a land use planner, currently with the Bennington County Regional Commission and previously as the Planning and Zoning Director for the Town of Manchester. I am here to testify in support of H-687. The bill has the potential to lead to meaningful protection of Vermont's landscape and biodiversity, while at the same time further addressing the state's housing needs. This bill underscores that addressing the climate crisis is inextricably linked to addressing the state's housing crisis by aiming to protect ecosystem functions while facilitating the development of denser and more vibrant built environments in our community cores. Although Act 250 can be rightfully credited with saving Vermont from indiscriminate and uncontrolled development, for too long it has allowed continued small-scale sprawl that has had negative consequences on our forest environments, our working rural landscape, the development of an adequate supply of housing, and on the vitality of our towns and villages. By restructuring the board that implements the law, and underpinning its implementation on approved future land use mapping. Vermont's land use goal of compact, vital, and resilient centers surrounded by working rural lands and protected natural areas will be better served. I will focus my testimony on provisions of H-687 that I think may need further clarification or revision to maximize the effectiveness of the proposed reforms particularly with respect to the ability of Vermont municipalities to secure the Tier 1A and Tier 1B planned growth area designations that will reinforce centralized development within our community cores and <clears throat> protection of rural character and ecological integrity outside of those cores. This will happen by incentivizing environmentally responsible development in the core areas with Act 250 exemptions and ensuring clustered and environmentally responsible development outside of those cores through improved implementation of Act 250 review and permitting. First of all, it is clear that the proposed reformulations will take years to roll out and implement. Consequently, in the interim, uh, it will be critical that the Act 250 exemptions that were uh, for priority housing projects within state designate, designated areas that were enacted under the HOME Act are carried forward until the new Act 250 rubric is in place. Therefore, I support H652 as introduced by Representative Bongartz as a companion to H687. As currently contemplated under H-687, the Tier 1B designation will not likely be attainable by most municipalities for which it was intended or envisioned. In the Bennington region, only Bennington and possibly Manchester would be eligible for consideration of the Tier 1A designation, and none of the remaining 15 municipalities in this region would likely meet the requirements for Tier 1B designation. This is because they lack staff capacity to meet the requirements and none operate both municipal water and wastewater systems. Although three incorporated villages utilize the Bennington and Manchester water and wastewater systems, they lack staff capacity. To maximize the effectiveness of the bill, it will be important to consider revisions that will allow more, more municipalities to attain the designations. Accordingly, I suggest the following revisions for H-687. Incorporate regional future land use categories and mapping into regional plan adoption procedures as proposed by VAPTA representatives, Charlie Baker and Catherine, Dim Catherine Dimitrick. These future land use categories should be clearly defined and delineated from the designation categories contemplated in H-687. Consider requiring only a municipal water or wastewater system 
or allowing for the development of community scale water and wastewater systems with proposed development for the tier 1B municipalities. Require flood hazard and river corridor regulations for tier 1B municipalities unless there are no identified flood hazards or river corridors within the municipal boundaries. Articulate minimum standards for permanent subdivision regulations. These are currently not spelled out in statute or rule. Articulate minimum standards for wildlife habitat bylaws contemplated under 10 BSA section 6032B1H in the bill. These, there are likely very few municipalities that have any such bylaws currently, and most would require assistance to develop and adopt minimum standards to be eligible for the tier 1A or 1B designations. Increase RPC capacity to help with municipal staffing deficiencies for contemplated tier 1B towns and villages. Coordination on future land use mapping and assistance with adopting land use regulations that meet minimum standards for designation. Increase capacity of the Department of Housing and Community Development Bylaw Modernization Grant Program to assist more municipalities to adopt land use regulations that meet minimum standards for Tier 1A and Tier 1B designations. Insofar as the online ANR Natural Resource Atlas GIS data will be uh, used to help develop regional and local land use maps, the atlas must be updated with current and corrected data on a more regular basis. And finally, consider removing language from 10 VSA section 6027C, allowing the board to designate or require a regional planning commission to receive applications, provide administrative assistance, and perform investigations on Active 50 applications. Although RPCs are regularly called upon to comment on applications for development with regional impacts, they have not been tasked to assist in the administration of Act 250 and are likely not equipped to do so. The key idea that will lead to better land use decisions going forward is basing Act 250 jurisdiction on approved future land use maps. This will shift us to better decision making early in the land use permitting process and reduce conflict and unintended consequences later. These maps will be developed with close collaboration between RPCs and municipalities, reflecting the long standing working relationships that the RPCs share with their member municipalities. As you continue to work on H687, I would welcome the opportunity to comment further, and I'm happy to answer any questions that committee members may have this morning for me. Great, thank you for your testimony this morning. Um, I have a, a, maybe I have one to start off, which is your suggestion that GIS data be more regularly updated. Um, I guess, can you speak to that? What's the data that is not being updated and what would regularly look like? Uh, so the the natural resources atlas, the online data that um, identify particularly some of the rare, threatened, and endangered species and communities data, some of that um, data, also deer wintering areas, a lot of it is just dated. And you know, for instance, in Manchester, I know there's a large deer wintering area identified on there that is. Um, mostly now developed and has been for many years. Um, so I don't know um, how to do that. I mean, you, um, I, I don't know. It's just, it's just something that I noticed when I was um, administering an ordinance in Manchester and, you know, that there are some, there's some old data on that, um, on that layer in particular. Yeah, no, that's very helpful. They have, yeah, I'm not sure when the last time those were updated. Representative Sibelia, then Stebbins. Uh, good morning, Janet. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, can you give me an example of when um, these future land use maps um, might change? So when we might see a change in the future land use maps, or do you think that these are kind of one and done maps? Uh, no, I don't think uh, I don't think they should be one and done. Um, 
you know, the landscape changes um, all the time. And um, so I, I think that the eight year, the every eight year um, cycle that uh, regional plans and municipal plans go through will inform any needed changes on, on those maps. Can you think of any, can, can you help me understand like how land might change to shift categories? Um, I know I'm putting you on the spot here. But yeah, I, I mean, I haven't question. thought about that that much, but, you know, maybe there's, maybe there's uh, a municipality that continually, its core continually floods and maybe there be a plan for um, over the course of many years shifting the core of the municipality out of the floodplain um, and maybe that would uh, result eventually in changes to the the future land use map that, that's one example um, you know maybe there would maybe there would be some other sort of um, natural uh, event that would change the um, characteristics of of certain lands. Um, yeah, I I haven't thought about that, but I, I'll think about it further <laughs> and see if makes, I can. Uh, makes me think about the um, increased number of landslides that we've seen on the landscape, mm -hmm. and how yeah. would those be, how would those be incorporated in a in a map like this? Um, you know, maybe they would become part of the critical, um, the the uh, the category that um, the tier three in the in the six eighty seven, and mm -hmm. the future land use map um, that informs these these three tiers in this bill. I haven't really thought that much about the relationship between them. I do point out in my testimony that I feel like that does need to be um, further uh, contemplated in this bill. All right, thank you. Representative Bongarts. Well, I was only going to say in response to mm -hmm. Sevilla's question that, and, and your answer is that towns just may also rethink. Um, and that, that would relate to, for instance, changing the towns, <clears throat> potentially changing the town center rather than based on consistent flooding or, or maybe deciding that they went one direction early and wanted to either make it tighter or go the other direction. But I think towns rethink, towns over time might want to rethink and things would get tweaked and thus the, thus the every other eight years, the every eight years. Right. Representative Sevilla. So that suggests to me that the towns um, kind of have final uh, determination on these maps, but my understanding of what we're looking at, the board has, that these are approved by the Natural Resources Board. So is the board, Am, am I not understanding yeah, that correctly? Oh, Both. My own sense yeah. is that the board, the, the way I understand this, the board would have to approve changes. There may be some way that we could, we're going to wait for minor tweaks to not have to go through the full process. I don't know. But uh, but yeah, in, in this cycle, things would change and the board would look. And they'd be working with the RPCs in the first instance, the towns and communities reaching, reaching kind of consensus on a change and then taking it to the board, depending on the scale. I don't think. I just want to give Janet a chance here. Did you want to add anything? I'm. I mean, the the way that Seth has described that, I would say, yeah. I I don't think any of these kinds of changes would come out of the blue and be a surprise to <laughs> the board by the time it got to the board. You know, um, the you know our our regional planning commissions have. Um, consistently worked with towns closely on the development of their plans and currently the regional planning commission you know approves those plans and i'm not aware of any circumstances in which by the time it gets to a regional planning commission a town plan is not approved um, it's i think a very rare event um, so i would imagine the same kind of um you know working relationship would pass up to the 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 newly conceived environmental board for these kinds of of approvals 
to continue on this thread? Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I um, you know, I'm just, I'm just struggling to think. I mean, like we are, uh, the town plans uh, are really going to have a whole different level of meaning um, in terms of the mapping there uh, with this aligning jurisdiction with the mapping that I think they don't have now. I, you know, would you agree or or would you challenge that? And if you would challenge that, help me understand why this is not really going to be of consequence to communities. Um, I think that all of the town plans have mapping now and they that mapping is reflected in regional plans now. Um, this might, this bill might um, underscore that it'll be much more important to make sure that the regional plans are accurately reflecting those um, local um, town plan maps. Um, but I don't think it, um, I don't think it fundamentally changes the, um, you know, the, the fact that the town plan fee informs the regional plan and what's changing is that these categories will have um, more meaning in terms of the implementation or the jurisdiction of Act 250. And so what that means is that as the regional planning commissions work with towns to develop the certainly, or at least the regional, the future land use map in the regional plan, that it must be much more careful to be sure that there are not um, conflicts between the local and regional pl uh, plan maps. Representative Stebbins. It's a shift in gear, so yes. Um, good morning. Uh, on Tuesday, we heard uh, testimony about what's going on with our, uh, our, our waste from a lot of failed septic systems. We know that various older uh, municipal uh, sewer systems have overflows. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned, it, and, and we have a, you know, we're environment and energy, so we're, we're thinking about planning, but there's also, you know, where do we put all of our uh, uh, waste. So my question is, you mentioned tier 1B and that it's not currently likely attainable for a lot of communities. Um, I'm, I'm wondering what you think the appropriate balance is to try and make sure that, uh, you know, if we have a community that doesn't have staff and has water, but not sewer or sewer, but, you know, what is that balance to make sure that um, we're not setting communities up for failure in terms of what then happens with human waste. I think um, the state uh, permit system for water supply and wastewater uh, disposal, you know, that nothing's changed there. And development within these more rural villages um, without water and or wastewater systems already, they still have to meet those environmental, you know, standards in terms of what's being proposed for development. It still has to have a water supply and, and wastewater system that is, um, that meets those standards. And so I think what I suggested is that if we want to in if we want to incentivize development in these smaller cores um it's not likely going to happen because uh, our, under this under the way the bill is currently written it's not likely going to happen that they'll get the act 250 exemption to provide that incentive unless we consider something other than already existing larger water supply and wastewater systems. And so, I mean, my understanding is I'm, it's certainly not my area of expertise, but that there has been a lot of work in recent years um, to uh, develop smaller scale community level systems that could function essentially as a municipal system for um, 
this this kind of uh, scale of development in in these kinds of rural cores. Yeah, uh, I mean, we do have a couple of bills on the wall um, that relate to you know alternative systems. Um, that if we had time, it'd be great. I don't think we will have time to talk about them, but clearly that's something that we need to talk about in the future. Other questions for Ms. Hurley? Do you have another question? I um, would love to kind of talk about the regional plans and the process for that and how that could change for an extended period of time at this, so. Is that a question? Uh, it's, would you like me to, I mean, I could continue like just asking a bunch of questions or I could focus them if we have another opportunity to have discussion about that. Um, I think we still have time with Janet Hurley. So you want to start? Okay. Uh, so I really am trying to, and, and I'm trying to get to, uh, an understanding here about decision-making, um, and who is making decisions. So would it be possible, do you think, for a community to say, a, a community and the Natural Resources Board to disagree and, and the Regional Planning Commission about a critical resource area in the town? And, and if there was disagreement, who gets the final say? I mean, I guess what's at stake is an Act 250 exemption. <laughs> so, um, you know, I don't, I, I can't envision something that would be a, a disagreement between the board and a, and a locality. Um, you know, I still see that, um, you know, the local planning commission is the body that develops its local um, plan, its local land use plan. And it does so with input from its municipal, you know, its municipal citizenry. And it's um, the legislative body of that municipality that adopts that plan. That plan has to meet um, statutory requirements um, but within the statutory requirements, you know, it's, it's a plan that's developed by the locality. Um, so, and as I said earlier, I'm unaware of any instances um, in which a local plan that was duly adopted with public input and that meets statutory um, requirements has been rejected by a regional planning commission. I think because of the, um, the proposed um, tier 1A and tier 1B categories that it'll be more important that the regional plan be carefully, especially the maps, be carefully um, delineated so that there are no conflicts with these local plans. Um, but those local plans inform the regional plan. It's not, it doesn't come down from the top. It's the local plans are developed locally and they inform the regional plans, which, um, so um, I'm not sure I'm getting at everything that you are um, asking me to, but um, I, I, I don't see that this bill is taking away, um, you know, the local, the, the importance of the local, the localities coming up with their own plans. So uh, I can certainly envision a, a community saying we want to develop this area and uh, the regional, the RPC saying this is a critical resource area, you really can't, uh, the natural resources board saying this is a critical, I can certainly see conflict there. And um, I, you know, I don't know that how much that exists right now. 
And in fact, I would anticipate that happen given um, some of uh, the rural towns that I'm aware of. Um, are they towns that would want this 1A or 1B designation? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I think it's just, I think it's really important um, for us to be very clear about what is changing here and helping particularly communities that don't have a lot of capacity understand what's changing. And, and Janet, uh, I don't know if you were on when Charlie was testifying earlier. Janet is in uh, my region and, uh, you know, we, we work very closely. We understand how important a resource the RPCs are for our communities, but these are historic changes that we are considering here. And uh, on the other side of the mountains in Southern Vermont, um, you know, there's been some uh, challenges around around quorums um, with our RPC. Um, there have been some challenges um, with our district commission on some, you know, we have three-year permits. And so when we talk about, you know, the only thing that's at stake here is whether or not you are exempt from an Act 250 permit. Well, that's actually, you know, having the jurisdiction of an Act 250 permit uh, for a working Vermonter or someone who's trying to, um, develop their land or start their business could actually be a very significant cost, a very significant amount of time, which may be appropriate. Um, but I think it's important that we're very clear about that. And so those can be powerful motivators for conflict, for a community, for instance, to say, no, we want to develop in this area, an area that may in fact be an area that shouldn't be developed in. And so I'm trying to get to the nature of, you know, how that conflict is going to be resolved. I think what the bill says is that the NRB resolves that. And that may be the right thing. What I'm concerned about is how do our communities know this is coming, which, because that's a pretty significant change. So I, I, a lot of statement there, uh, but invite you to kind of push back on me or for the chair mm -hmm. to pull uh, if she'd like, but the, these are things <laughs> that I'm, I'm worrying about. Yeah, I mean, you know, the the jurisdictional trigger for Act 250 currently in those towns um, is is the same as it will be, um, except for the the road rule. I guess the language has changed around the distance from um you know an already um established highway um instead of the length of the the road that is proposed i guess but um but i don't see that it's changing uh act 250 jurisdictional triggers uh beyond that so i'm not sure that this um reconceptualization of the implementation of the act in terms of um, these maps will will further burden anybody. Um, I think what it is is it is allowing for an Act 250 exemption under certain circumstances. Um, you know the the. So I don't see how it is, um, I don't see how it is going to re, uh, lead to being more of a burden to anybody. I think what it's doing is it's relieving that burden um, for development that occurs within these identified cores that have strong um, land use regulations. Those are not the places that I'm actually talking about. I'm thinking more about tier two, tier three, flood corridors or river corridors, which is not in this bill, but is in this building and is likely to be a part of this, um, which would be a pretty significant change in terms of, um, could be, could be a significant change in terms of mapping 
Right, but is it changing any um, jurisdictional triggers for Act 250 and how um, Act 250 is administered? Why are we doing the maps? To identify areas that um, would be eligible for exemption. But we are not, so those are not the only areas that we are identifying in the mapping, right? Um, no, there are three tiers, yes. And if Bonkar tells me this goes to your <clears throat> point, you that you made partway through your testimony about making decisions up front during the planning process and having them be clearer there and then not utilizing the regulatory aspects for after the fact planning, which I would, I think you were alluding to this, is really in everybody's interest. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's where we, when, when Rep. Sevilla is talking about the, the fact that the, the mapping will have, you know, does, there, are different, there are different jurisdictional triggers beyond simply the core areas for tier three. Mm -hmm. uh, that's right. I like the, the 2,500 foot rule. Um, yeah. yeah. I think that's an important point that rep, thank you, Representative Bonnegards, you know, we're making planning decisions up front. And so that is, again, that is a historic change. I think it's probably as, no? Then why are we doing it? I, um, I, yeah. <laughs> Representative Simmons. I, I mean, I feel like there's been a lot of planning for a long time. And from my understanding, the question is, is, is it, is it locationally based, based off of, you know, whether or not it makes sense to build there in the future, whether or not it makes sense to make sure we keep forests there so it doesn't have a landslide on the town. Like it, it hasn't, we've done a lot of planning that hasn't necessarily correlated with how it relates to natural resources. And then the other piece is we've done a lot of planning that to your point, um, people only really wake up once a permit is filed. And so it's not necessarily planning that I mean, sometimes it's been helpful, but my sense is it hasn't always real. It's been more of an academic exercise that hasn't necessarily always really informed the discussion of how do we want to develop and where. Yeah. So I, I that's why I made that face is I, I do think we've done a lot of planning. There's a lot of planning. It's just has it been useful, helpful, actionable and um, yeah, I would say it's been perhaps inconsistent. Many towns have done proactive planning. That's been helpful. Yes. <clears throat> yeah. yeah, and I think the we is something that I think about a lot. And um, you know, who is we? Yeah. So I, you know, there's we in this room, and then there's we that run our towns and we that live on my road um, and just making sure that we're connecting all of those dots because they are all connected and in terms of the decision making and communication. Right. I would like to give you an opportunity, Janet, to um, add anything else before we shift to our next witness. Um, I guess just that you know, one of the things about Act 250 is that, as I said, it, it can certainly be credited with saving Vermont from indiscriminate development that, you know, will have marred our landscape, but that because of its implementation as and because it's seen as so cumbersome that people all over the state, um, small scale developers, will do anything to avoid triggering Act 250. And so what's happened is we get a lot of, um, you know, nine lot subdivisions in the outskirts of towns. And um, 
and that sort of thing. Um, so it's it needs to be something that is not as cumbersome to get a permit for, <laughs> you know, for for it, it needs to be something that isn't something that everybody's going to run away from. And I think that part of what this bill is doing is it's trying to make it um, something that is not as um, objectionable to um, I think it's trying to streamline um, the the implementation of the Act 250 review and permitting. And I think that's a really important um, part of this bill. Yeah, I, it, I want to know, I see that. And I see the benefit of that. And I know mm -hmm. that, um, and it's in a very, very, very small part of Vermont. Um, that there's a lot of interest in developing. Um, I am interested in awareness, communication, empathy, engagement with the rest of Vermont about what we are doing, because we are not just making it easier in that very small, important part that we want to develop in, in this building, we are making it harder outside of that, I think. Or at least we are changing the rules outside of that area. And so, you know, when we are changing the rules, I think it's really important that we talk about how to talk to Vermonters about that, why we're doing it, how they can engage, how conflict will be resolved, what we anticipate for conflict. So that's it, thanks. We do need to move on. I guess there's one more from Representative Stebbins and then we will let you have the rest of your day back. <laughs> Actually, it's a question for you. No, nope. okay. Oh, do you, do you want me to sign out or it's you not can, a question for me? It's not a question for you, apparently. I wanna thank you very okay. much for taking the time to thoroughly review and give good input and to volunteer to continue to help us. So thank you for that. Okay. Very much. Thank you thank for you. having me. Yeah. Thank you. And you're welcome to see in the Zoom room if you like. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> um, Representative Stevens. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, I should know <clears throat> 687 better than I do, but offhand of the 60 plus pages, I am not remembering how much, if there is commentary on the public outreach communication process. I found it helpful um, that Mr. Coster was here the other day, sort of, you know, talking about some of the processes that ANR currently does, but um, maybe at some point, I'm, I'm curious whether or not you'd be willing to sort of spend a little bit more time looking at how do we make that conversation trickle, you know, down and up. Um, because having held many, many public meetings in my life, you can do postings, you can do notices, but people are busy, they don't show up. Um, or, you know, so how do we how do we connect to that key question of how do we bring people to the conversation and make sure that if they want to be part of that conversation, they are? Yep. Yeah, we can learn more about how people are doing that successfully now and how we make sure it's in our bill. <laughs> That's probably a good segue to Megan Sullivan joining us. Welcome. Good morning. Back. Thank you. Megan Sullivan, Vice President of Government Affairs for the Vermont Chamber of Commerce. It's nice to see you all again today. Um, so yesterday I spoke um, about the Tier 1, um, and I think uh, I'm starting today talking about the land use uh, mapping, and then I'm going into Tier 2 and 3, I think is uh, what I'm here for. So. Um, you know, I think the the coordination that happened over the summer and fall on the three studies, the, the NRB study, which is specific to Act 250, and, and I'm going to keep coming back to that because, I, you know, our housing crisis is not going to be solved by Act 250 alone. Um, I'm talking about Act 250 in here because that's the, com that's the steering committee I was on, um, but know that... Um, that there is so much more that needs to be done for our housing crisis. Um, it's not going to be part of my conversation today unless you have questions to ask, you know, what are the other ways we're, we're working on this? Um, but for the Act 250 piece, 
um, the opportunity to uh, work on our housing, you know, as was just said, that people who want to avoid it at all costs, um, we know that there's there's challenges um, for people to go through it. Um, on the, the mapping, I think, is an important piece to say, okay, if we're going to move to location-based jurisdiction, jurisdiction, we need to know where those locations are and what we're talking about. Um, and, and so the delineation that's done to really understand our land um, and recognize that we're not talking about um, a blank slate. We have existing housing and infrastructure um, and buildings that are here that may not have um, been done in the way that if we were starting over, we would do them, but they are here and we need to acknowledge their existence. Um, and I think that's an important recognition um, that we have that we can't start from scratch. We need to acknowledge what exists um, and how to and how to think about that. So things like the, the enterprise areas, which are part of tier two or that are saying, this is a, a, an industrial park and maybe it's not where today when we're thinking about complete communities, we would put um, these job centers, but it exists today and um, we need to acknowledge that it's there and, and think about what that means for our future. Um, the only thing I would, you know, say is that when we go from um, the idea of, you know, the study on on the big idea to then the mapping and the planning, then the implementation, we need to be cognizant of um, what does that mean for an individual um, if they're coming to say, I'm going, I want to build four units of housing, I want to build um, another house on my land. Um, that they're not looking at 13 different, well, where am I on this map? What does this mean to me? And they're you know, likely gonna go to their town and ask, and if their town can't figure it out, um, this is where I think that that challenging part comes in of how do we take um, these maps um, that acknowledge the existing infrastructure and, and development that we have and incorporate the reality of what what people are going to need to do and and figure out. Um, so you know, I think I think there's opportunities for that. But just as we're looking at implementing the the land use mapping, um, that that needs to be part of the conversation of of how do we make sure this is accessible for everyone. Um, bringing environmental justice and social justice voices into that conversation is also, I think, critically important um, to make sure that we're acknowledging where. Um, land use mapping um, has a history of being exclusionary um, that has had um, implications for uh, minorities and, and low income uh, people nationally and in Vermont. It's just part of our history. I think we have to all acknowledge and then think about really consciously as we move forward. Um, any questions on that part before I sort of go? Yeah. Okay. Um, on um, tier two and three. So I, I think this has been a really important process, you know, for, for the chamber. Um, you know, I think a few years ago we were saying, you know, no way on the road roll. Um, and I think this process has really um, has helped us to think about, you know, we need development. And I think it's helped um, bringing these communities together of um, conservationists and um, developers and housing advocates um, and business advocates bringing us into the room to say, you know, we can no longer have this argument that we can't do housing because of um, our, our environmental challenges and we can't fix, we can't address our environmental challenges because of housing. Those, those pieces have been at odds I feel like um, in this building and and in the state and nationally um, for a while. And I think this process has really given the opportunity to say, these don't need to be at odds. They can work together, but it's really hard. And we have to be really aware of the decisions we make because of um, the impacts that they can have. Um, so, you know, when we're seeing the opportunity to say, we're going to define areas 
And those areas need to look at not just where we're growing now, and this gets into that environmental justice saying, we're not just going to say we are gonna put affordable housing in floodplains and have the people who can least afford um, to deal with these impacts having to relive this impact over and over again. But um, it means we're going to need to allow and incentivize growth outside of there. Um, and you know the priority housing projects have been incredibly effective. Um, and I certainly hope our housing committees are looking at how do we continue to incentivize that because we also need to be incentivizing middle income housing um, so that people have an opportunity to move um, up in their housing um, as, as their um, circumstances change. Um, and that when we're outside of those areas um, that need to incorporate these, these housing goals, um, that we're not saying no to development, but we're again incentivizing more compact development. Um, and that's really how we came to, to agree to the 2000 foot road rule of saying, if you can, um, if you're looking at building housing, um, that it continues to be done in a more compact settlement pattern. Um, and there, are, you know, there is still a need for single family homes. You know, I think there's a lot of people who, who strive for that life to I live in a single family home. And I'm sure there are other people in this room that live in single family homes. I think we're not saying you can't build single family homes anymore, but saying if we're going to continue to um, do that, that if it's, that the incentive is to do it in a compact way. Um, and if we're not doing it in a compact way, then looking at um, potential impacts that it can have. Um, I do, you know, again, I, I disclosed yesterday, I'm not a planner um, or a lawyer. Um, I'm an economic development specialist. So that's, that's my frame. So that brings me, I think maybe helpfully, hopefully to a point of looking at some of the definitions that don't come from a background world that I live in and have me asking questions that I hope are helpful for the committee to be thinking about. Um, so when I'm looking at definitions um, for, you know, I think I'll start with habitat as we get into tier two and tier three, and, you know, means the physical and biological environment in which a particular species of plants or wildlife lives. What does that mean? You know, what is a particular species of wildlife? And, you know, this is where I want, um, where we see opportunity for the appeals um, that I think is what, what we need to really contain. So if I've got squirrels running around, is that a habitat? And if they run from this tree to that tree, is that a connecting habitat? You know, I think that's where we need the definition. What is the wildlife that we're talking about? What is the particular species? And this is where, when we were do, talking about tier three in the NRB um, steering committee, um, where it said, you know, we really need to understand this better and study this better so there aren't unintended consequences of saying, we're gonna say impacted wildlife corridors, and then that is open to very broad interpretation or um, plant species, you know, what does that, what are we protecting there? Each, just so we can- Yes, 36, sorry. You know, and then um, 37, it says necessary wildlife habitat and endangered species, but you know, if I'm a, uh, trying to understand as a um, lay person who wants to develop some housing, what does that mean? Um, I think this is where we really need to help people understand. Yeah. Representative well, Bond, I point out the term necessary habitat, wildlife habitat comes from active fit that's been there for a long, long time. It's been filled out by, and by decisions of it. So I'll just point that out. That's how it happened. That's how it has happened in the past. So uh, the habitat corridor would, is that also? Oh, no, I'm on the okay. Without okay. Yeah, you're, you're raising, you're raising yeah. legitimate. Okay. Great. Right. These are all the things for me to know. <laughs> <laughs> we have to think through. Um, the other question I had, um, 
in the definition of fragmentation, you know, I think we're clearly here trying to, you know, this is getting at forest fragmentation. Um, but if this is going to be you that happens in, um, as part of the criteria for all um, tier two or tier three, um, you know, I, I have concerns around um, any, the construction, conversion, relocation, or enlargement of any building or other structure. Um, the, just, uh, I think, important to note, if it, excuse me. Um, yeah, thank you. I do really appreciate your question. So I'm not yeah. pushing back at all, but I appreciate I think it. orienting us to the bill. These are used after Act 250 would be already triggered in right. that, in that as the new criteria. Yes. Yep. No, I understand that. Wait. So these are so it's triggered and tell us where you are if you're doing this. Yep. Page 36 fragmentation line starting at line eight. Um, but any change in the use of any building or any other structure. So that's where, you know, I think about um, or land. Um, if you have an existing home in what becomes tier two, um, does any change in their use of land or their use of building mean they have to get, they have to go through Act 250? And that's of concern. On an existing property, right. this, this would apply to existing development. But if it's a change in use of any building. But this is, so this is not a jurisdictional trigger. That's my point. So this is, if you are already triggering Act 50, you would be net. Just this would have to an additional it. criteria under the 10 criteria, right? So it's the new fragmentation criteria that we've been talking about for a long time. So it's not new. So I guess the a change of use in building, so someone could change the use in their building and not trigger. So when does the change of use in building trigger that then that would be reviewed under this? Perhaps if you're already under Act 250 jurisdiction. It would really be only if you're already under term, if the change of use. It wouldn't, wouldn't, okay. Like in you, tier two, there's nothing in tier two that suggests anybody would automatically be under any kind of jurisdiction other than other than now. So it would tend to be a change if, you, if your project is under, it's the way it always works in Act 250. So if your project mm -hmm. is under Act 250 and there's a change, then you have to get that uh, permitted. But this wouldn't change that would be only if you're already under. So if you're, if you went through Act 250 for your development, and now you had a change of use. You have to do that under. You would have to. Yeah. Right. For the existing criteria, you'd have to do it. <clears throat> this would only ensure, would it, this would only add a look at fragmentation, which would in 90, I would guess in most cases, if we're talking about like a house would, well, anyway, I won't, I won't speculate what it, what it would mean, but it's, this isn't a jurisdictional trigger. Right now, if you're under Act 50 jurisdiction, there's a change, you have to get the, an amendment. This doesn't change that. It only says that along with everything else, the commission would look at fragmentation. Whether fragmentation. It's, whether, there's an, whether there's an implication of fragmentation. Um, okay. And so I, I think the um, the question I have then is what you know what are the requirements? Something that the steering committee talked about was if if a development is triggered by the road rule, do you need to do you need to go through all thirty two criteria? Um, and I think similarly, if you've got to hire an engineer to say this doesn't fragment to sign off in your filing that says this isn't a forest fragmentation issue, you know, that adds cost. Um, and I think that's where, uh, you know, some of these added costs of looking at how we understand how an applicant looks, gets to criteria. Um, you know, I, I spoke with an engineer prior to the session 
um, who said, you know, this is, you know, certainly going to, Act 250 is a lot of what he does is providing applicants with studies and um, said it's, it's great for business, but there are some things that are just feels like we're charging them so they can check a box that, that, shouldn't necessarily need to be checked. And it wasn't in our purview in the steering committee to get into the 32 criteria to see, um, you know, are all of these necessary for everything that we're talking about? Um, but I think, you know, that's a worthy question to be asking and maybe, you know, um, something that a professional board should be looking at. If if something is triggering, if, if the road rule is triggering um, and, it's for one house. Do you need to be looking at traffic impacts and um, educational impacts? Um, so I guess that's that sort of comes around on my fragmentation question. <laughs> Do we need all of the criteria for all triggers? Yeah, representatives to be there. Yeah, I was going to ask actually for an example. Um, rep Mungar stopped himself from speculating. So maybe that's something that we could um, get from an appropriate to say that gets NRB or the RPCs or something. So I worry about the fragmentation. I think you're so I'm moving on to as well. <laughs> she may be able to speak to that later when on you the change of use on the change of use question specifically. If you have Sabina Haskell with chair of the board natural resources board, if you have a permit and it's a change of use, there's an amendment that you'll need, need to do. If you're, if you're going from a single residential that didn't have a permit and you decide to build a gravel pit on your property, you're going to need, that's, you're going to need a, per, a permit, whether you had a permit before or not, because it's a change of use that is, has impacts. And that was, that was the, uh, you know, that will, or it could be changing your house into a bed and breakfast, which is probably more likely. And then that, that would be a change of use because you'd be going from residential to commercial. And it might not have had a permit before. So dividing so my kid can build would not. If you have a permit now, right. you, if you don't, uh, I would, sorry, my attorneys aren't here. I think that's one where I'm not equipped to answer it, but I understand the question. It's one I'm really acutely interested in I, around the question of who do we want to live in rural Vermont or yeah. allow to live in rural Vermont? Because yeah. I know that my good friends from Connecticut who I meet with every weekend will be able to buy their way through the permit process, so. Yeah, so I think it would be, we don't have an attorney in the room with us and we can walk through all of the existing criteria and meet jurisdictional triggers and have this conversation when we have an attorney in the room. So I welcome hearing your questions. Yeah. And I would say that if they're legal questions, we'll do them with our yeah. attorney. Um, um, I just want, it, this is a very small point, but um, recreational purposes, that's the bottom of 36 into 37. Um, recreational trails, corridors that are not paved uh, and used for recreational purposes, including um, just from other bills I've worked on, sometimes putting including um, people take that to mean exclusively including those things. So other options then get questions. Well, can you, is that included? So um, language like such as, or that makes it clear this is not all inclusive. What it's including is I can say that let's, we use that word, including to say exactly what you're saying, which is that it's not exclusive. Yeah. That's a, and that's from our editors and our lawyers. So okay. that's how we. I've seen pushback on that before, but if that's has worked here, then we can. can right. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I do. Um, those were sort of my, my questions on some of the definitions that I saw and how that then leads to practical implementation. Um, I think, you know, it's, it's critical that we are, we're still allowing our rural communities to participate in 
becoming part of a vibrant economic future. And so that, how do we engage the communities? And I, you know, I, I, um, I found the page, which, you know, I had mentioned this, the, the page 51, where it talks about going to every community, the board will go to every community. Um, it'll get posted in lots of places. So, um, and that, that, that'll take a long time if the board has to go to every municipality. Um, but I think, you know, the, the intention there of engagement is important. And that was a lot of discussion that happened at the, the steering committee. And so whether it's um, the review board goes or if it's through the, the planning process that the RPCs, you know, are going um, to every community and, and that, um, you know, I certainly hope we're, we're working with municipalities to get it right on where everything is posted and recognizing some challenges of um, some of that, um, but but that public engagement on not only on tier one, but also if, as tier three is better defined um, on that tier three, that public engagement, um, understanding um, and feedback uh, is is critical. Talk to a community member in Waitsfield who was saying that they were they kept getting told there was a wildlife corridor corridor. And they said it is that they haven't bears haven't been on this land for 20 years. Um, so I think that that level of engagement is important. So appreciate the committee's commitment to to thinking about the best way to do that. That's efficient, but also um, really brings people into the conversation. Uh, and and that tier three, you know, so aligns with our goals that have already been stated around what we're con what we're conserving, um, and that we're really looking at not inequitable portion of Vermont turning into tier three, but thinking about these tier ones and tier threes really having similar status in in the the amount of land we're talking about and the process that we're talking about in public engagement. Questions from? I just, I, I hear you on adding tier three to this. This is um, currently as it's written, focused on the plan growth areas. Yeah. So not imagining going to every town but only the towns that were applying for the areas. Which we're hoping is gonna be a lot. I mean, I think that's, you know, important that it's a lot of towns that especially, you know, if not the tier 1A are tier 1B um, that are looking at areas um, that are talking about where we incentivize growth and, and housing and, um, and really community development that that I think the outcome needs to be that there are communities in every county of the state and that it's more the exception that a town decides they don't want to participate than, than they do. Yeah, I guess it, when we first looked at it up outside, just thinking about like if it was every town right out of the gate, it right. be realistic, but it won't be every town right out of the gate. It's something that would happen iteratively over time as towns kind of pursued this. <clears throat> right. <clears throat> yeah, I just again, I'm hoping we're in a housing crisis, um, and it is statewide, and we need the whole state to be coming together for it. And you know, I think that's why yesterday raised concerns about one B being um, unreachable for a lot of communities and or, um that we need to rethink if that if everything that that one B is asking for is really necessary for you know the housing development we're talking about. Representative Spilly. So to this point of every town and uh, you know the length of time that that will take. I mean, these. Do I understand correctly that we'd be identifying these areas as we're doing this mapping with the communities and the, the RPCs that will be approved by the NRB? It's not um, 
Currently, as drafted, this bill does not contemplate the board working on the mapping in every town. It, it is a ground up process that currently exists that towns develop their town plans. Mm -hmm. And this doesn't change that. So towns will still be developing their town plans and then working with the regional commissions to develop their future land use maps. And then those future land use maps would be approved by the board. Right. And this, these planned growth areas now, because we're talking about attaching jurisdiction, will be, I think, of much more import to communities to think about. Right? Mm -hmm. And so that, <clears throat> for me, I wonder how quickly, you know, it may not be as slowly as we're thinking. I mean, I think Townsend's, because there's jurisdiction that's contemplated to be attached to this if we were to pass such proposals. Um, I think we just have to think about a lot of towns may want to be thinking about that right out of the gate. Yeah, fair enough, we can. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. All right, uh, with that, we're going to shift gears to Charlie Hancock, who is joining us via Zoom. Hi, good morning. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Um, well, thank you so much for the opportunity to join you all today. Um, good to see committee members. And uh, I think I saw Sabina there in the back. So hi to Sabina. <laughs> so um, for the record, um, my name is Charlie Hancock. I am the chairman of the Montgomery Select Board. Um, my day job is also as a consulting forester. Although some days I don't know which one of those takes up more of my time. Um, so it's a pleasure to see you and thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. Um, I participated in the NRB report, which has already been touched upon uh, many times in the committee. And I believe that this is a solid framework upon which to build our work around Act 250 going forward. I also, like others, um, want to echo that the NRB report is a compromise framework, which addresses so many of the challenges that we're facing today. Um, and I want to emphasize compromise because for the vision to actually work, all the various components that are included in that report really need to be considered as a, as a package. Um, I also want to highlight that while the NRB report provides a solid framework, um, it did not get us fully across the finish line on many specific parts of what reform would look like, um, acknowledging that this is, you know, no surprise, really complicated and will require both greater data, greater data collection and synthesis, um, specifically when we talk about mapping, as well as greater buy-in from a broad and diverse set of stakeholders. Um, therefore, as it's been pointed out, you know, I think we need to be really deliberate and thoughtful about our next steps here. And I'll just echo what others have said about, it's not just about getting it done, but it's about getting it done right, which I think we all know. Um, so my own community of Montgomery, tucked way up here at the northern end of the state, is a rural community like the majority of other towns in Vermont. We have what I would consider really robust zoning, but we're currently working with our RPC to make our bylaws even stronger, addressing many of the challenges that you're all aware of. We're also in the process of developing a municipal wastewater system for our village centers, a principal objective of which is to increase housing availability. Um, as with smaller rural communities, our interaction with Act 250 looks a lot different um, than in the larger communities around the state, which are addressing a scale of projects, which are at an order of magnitude larger. Um, but it does have a significant impact here. Uh, before I get into a discussion of tiers two and three, I did briefly want to touch on tier one, because as these are all connected, the changes that we make in one area will affect the impact of the changes we make elsewhere. Um, so thinking about Montgomery, you know, changes to this tier one status will make an impact here. I can point to a 16 acre property right in Montgomery Center, one of our two designated village areas where our town plan and zoning really seeks to encourage dense compact development and which will be served by the municipal wastewater system we're slated to break ground on next spring. Um, we've got a developer looking to create a mixed commercial and residential uh, project there, which will result in 35 units of new housing, specifically targeting workforce and seniors. Um, so the tier one exemptions being put forward or the higher caps on jurisdiction as outlined in the NRB report would help remove one obstacle to making this project a reality as quickly as we're able to. 
Um, I do have some concerns about the planned growth area designation regulations that are currently in H687. Um, I think the intent behind them is spot on, but I would need greater specificity around some of the language outlined there, specifically around capital budget and uh, municipal staff requirements, some of the specific use language around how tall buildings have to be, um, and then some of the ancillary regs around like wildlife, ha wildlife habitat bylaws and how those would be crafted and implemented in this context. Um, one important point that came up through the NRB process and which was just discussed in the committee before I hopped on is that we really want all communities to have access um, to this designation status and to have, you know, a seat at the big kids table. Um, I'm also not really clear from the bill what would happen if a municipality, municipality couldn't hit all the marks as currently in the definition there. Um, you know, the NRB report created this tier 1A and tier 1B framework that you were just talking about, um, the goal of which is to make permanent relief accessible for all communities, um, even if we can't meet that highest bar. So I really would support a, a similar framework, which makes this accessible to every community in Vermont that's willing to put the time in. Because um, as you're aware, you know, different communities, especially rural communities, issues like capacity and budget, they, they hit a lot different. So shifting gears, looking at tier two um, and acknowledging that this will be the majority of the state as presented under the NRB uh, report framework. Um, your committee has heard a lot about forest fragmentation and forest loss already. Uh, I've been an advocate in this and other committees for incorporating forest fragmentation criteria in Act 250 for years. So this is a little bit like deja vu all over again. Um, so I won't go into the specifics about why all this is important. But I do think in the context that we're talking about today, it's important to highlight what we don't want housing development to look like in communities like ours here in Montgomery. Um, and, you know, they say a picture is worth a thousand words. So can folks see that okay? Again. Great. Um, so what you're looking at here is a 190 acre parcel in my own community of Montgomery. Um, this parcel Oops, if I can advance to the next picture. There we go. Um, this part, parcel, which was historically managed as a working forest, sits within both the highest priority forest block and highest priority connectivity area adjacent to Route 242, as identified by both state level and local uh, mapping projects and work around identifying these areas. Um, the property serves as headwaters and flood storage for a critical tributary of the Trout River, which passes right through Montgomery Center. And we all know the impacts of flooding and flood storage in our communities. Um, the property was subdivided into 15 building lots in a manner which managed to leapfrog Act 250 jurisdiction and the 1055 trigger. Um, essentially, what happened is the individual bought the property, plugged in the road network, and then did the subdivisions in a way where the first set took place um, through years one and two, and then they waited until after year six to do the second subdivision um, set of subdivisions. So there was no opportunity to review or address um, any of the design potential that would potentially mitigate the resource impacts that we're also concerned about here today. So now we have a road system totaling approximately 3,500 feet or about 0.6 miles, um, 15, 12 acre lots um, all chopped up up there and all done in a manner which managed to eat frog Act 250. Um, a framework such as the jurisdictional trigger of a road rule, um, as well as the added forest fragmentation criteria, both described in the NRB report, would address this, um, and I highly support you know adding those into Act 250. Um, I will add that that property, uh, through any number of reasons, ended up never actually um, selling any of those lots, and the property is currently on the market for 1.8 million dollars. Um, we're working to find a conservation buyer to essentially buy the property and conserve it back into the working landscape. So if any representatives have $1.8 million lying around that they want to contribute, please give me a call. Uh, no. So further regarding tier two, um, I do have some, some questions about the specifics in H687 um, and how the new jurisdictional criteria would apply. Um, from my reading, it looks like the bill outlines what I would understand to be more of a 500 foot road rule in practice. Um, I do think the 2000 foot framework outlined in the NRB report 
was an important compromise uh, in terms of essentially folks saying that's too long, that's too short. Um, and I worry that trying to reduce 2000 down to 500 could blow up the consensus that was reached there. Um, I also do want to flag the new definition of development as it applies to tier two areas, as, as I read the bill or I understand it, um, which would trigger jurisdiction for four or more units of housing in rural or working lands areas. And I'm, I'm reading rural and working lands areas to be what we're talking about is tier two. Um, and then also the revised definition of subdivision, which would drop the jurisdictional trigger from four lots to two four lots from 10 lots um, in this tier two area. I, I worry that the, the four lot trigger um, and the change to the definition might be too restrictive and it could potentially be in conflict with some of the incentives we're trying to create for compact development when it comes to the road rule. Um, so, you know, using the road rule as an incentive for developers to create this compact sorts of development in, in doing that, they could create a four lot subdivision, which is, is laid out, you know, perfectly fine as we, as we want to see them. Um, so again, I think the concern here is the impact of the lots, um, themselves. And that often depends on the design, not necessarily the number of them. Um, Lastly, in tier two, I, I do wonder the definition of development as being within 25 feet of a critical resource area. Um, and that's what I would understand the tier three areas we're talking about as outlined in the NRB report. Um, the way it's described with the 25 foot distance could be problematic and kind of confusing. So just a suggestion there would be just make the buffer part of the critical resource area. That could negate some of the issues. Um, moving on to tier three, um, again, this is my understanding is this is what we're calling uh, critical resource areas in H687. Um, I, I love the, the principle behind it and support the framework. I do have some concerns on how this is defined in the bill. Um, and, and frankly, I'm not entirely sure and clear how the intersection of this definition will work with the mapping work and the associated process out, outlined elsewhere. Um, but regarding the definition offered, um, it looks like this would drop the current um, jurisdiction trigger elevation wise from 2,500 feet to 2,000 feet. Um, I need to see a better GIS analysis of exactly how much land that would bring under jurisdiction. But my recollection from past number crunching with folks at ANR is that it's frankly a lot. Um, and while there was broad agreement in the NRB study committee that tier three areas require special attention under this framework, um, the expectation from the group that worked on the report was that tier three would really only apply to a small area of the state. Um, this seems like there's um, you know, an importance here in being deliberate about what we want to identify. And I, I do worry that just a straight elevational trigger drops might be a little bit too, too arbitrary. Um, so I would like to see a little bit more analysis there. Um, I also have a little concern around language uh, included about uh, any amount of prime agricultural soils fitting into how we define this area. Um, I think the intent is, is great and clear, but as defined, it could lead to some huge confusion around how this is applied in practice, given how soils are mapped and how a vast diversity of so soils might show up on any given parcel and how this would actually be applied in practice. Um, excuse me, I do think the definition in the bill is a great starting point, um, but the definition, um, but by this definition, we may be bringing in more land into tier three than we, we actually really intended to or intend to, um, and could also potentially leave out other areas that warrant greater resource protection. Um, as the NRB report said, any designation of specific tier three areas will require further analysis based on good science, careful mapping, and public engagement. Um, I am really excited to see that you've got Eric Sorensen and Liz Thompson coming in to speak to the committee. Um, when it comes to mapping, I do think Vermont conservation design is a fantastic starting point, um, but it is just that. It's a starting point. We'll need additional mapping support from ANR and the opportunity for RCPs to develop a process to assist in the development and mapping of these areas and that that, that process be uniform um, throughout all communities and founded on a principle of public engagement. So um, big picture, I am in full agreement that we need to advance a balance like what's proposed in the NRB report with the exemptions in designated areas and the heightened resource protection in others, or really just the simple opportunity to review development in these areas. 
And H687 is currently drafted as a fantastic starting point. Um, but like most things, the devil's in the details. And there's still some details that I think need to be worked out. Um, lastly, I did just want to quickly comment about the important connection between economic development and um, housing and the conversations we're having around Act 250 and resource protection. Um, couched in this uh, is a critical need to address permit relief for working lands businesses such as farm and forest enterprises. Um, Act 250 has been critical in maintaining this land base, uh, but I'd like to highlight that it's the success of these enterprises that themselves is foundational to maintaining the landscape that Act 250 seeks to protect. And rural communities like Montgomery's really depend on these enterprises. Um, I sometimes feel, unfortunately, like we might be forgetting that a little bit as a state. And so um, when we pop the hood open on Act 250, if we are looking to make some changes, there's a few uh, additional ones that I would love to be under consideration. Um, one was in the NRB report. It's a recommendation that we lower the ag soils mitigation um, criteria for uh, forest processing enterprises to a one-to-one -one ratio. Um, that's the same ratio we currently give industrial parks. Um, that's one small point that I think could make a big difference. Um, and it's one place we could start Another area that I think we could find some uh, consensus on, which was developing in the study committee, but we didn't have time to fully get there, was how timber harvesting um, at an elevation above 2,500 feet is considered. Uh, currently, that requires an Act 250 permit. Um, I do think there's an opportunity to perhaps move this out of jurisdiction and into a framework where it's handled uh, more similarly to how we handle the ecologically significant treatment areas or ESTAs in UVA, um, I think housing it there might be a better opportunity for review um, through a process which would better take into account the concerns we're addressing. So again, if we're going to pop the hood on Act 250, I would also love to see some, some things be included around issues that are facing these working lands businesses because, again, their success really is critical to conserving this landscape that we care so much about. Um, so with that, I will end my testimony. Thanks so much. Thank you for your testimony. I um, hope that you can submit it in writing because you were talking very quickly for us to keep up. And yeah. so, we mostly just were listening. Um, it'd be really helpful to get it in writing. And I do, we always appreciate your perspective, um, which comes from a, a number of views, like roles that you hold in your life. So thank you for that. Um, I'd like to follow up um, with your thoughts on the tier two area and um, your concerns and the visual that you provided us. I guess for me, you know, we're trying on this 500 foot um, kind of buffer from existing town roads for a couple of reasons. One of which is that there's um, already a lot of private roads that have been built and to tie uh, protection of our rural and working lands um, to the trigger of new roads. Um, and we're going to look more closely at the GIS of that um, in the next, probably tomorrow, I think. So we'll stay tuned for more actual data on that. But that that's the thinking behind it. And then also, you know, you're in the NRB proposal, leaving the vast majority of the state under the same jurisdictional triggers that we have today. Um, we saw an E911 map of what has been built in just the last like, I don't know, since 2016 to 2023, I think, or um, yesterday, it's significant. And um, so to leave us there uh, isn't really, I don't think, going to kind of pump the brakes on our loss of contiguous forest areas and our, for that matter, our working farmlands as well. So I have concerns about that. I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, no, I, I share your concerns. Um, and I think my 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 concerns kind of fall into two areas. One is how we can protect these resources through something like a road rule and how that's applied on the landscape and the impact of it. And then from a little bit more of a pessimistic side, um, I've seen this happen as you guys have too uh, over a number of sessions in the legislature where we weren't able to get something across the finish line. And there's a part of me that that worries that worries that we got to find a number that works for everybody. And I don't want that number to be so small that it takes a significant segment of the folks that are needed to pass this and, and pushes them out of the conversation or the room. And I mean, I would leave that to you guys to figure out because you're much smarter and better at that than me and you're in the rooms. Um, but I think my, my main concern is 
at the end of the day, a road rule is going to be a compromise. And I want to make sure that whatever we put forward is a compromise that we can get a consensus around so that we can finally get forest fragmentation criteria and a jurisdictional trigger in place to address the things that we're seeing. So that's kind of a long-winded way of saying, I totally agree with what you're saying. And I think we need a framework which addresses all the concerns that you raised. I also just want to make sure that we can actually do it. Do members have other questions? Thanks again for your testimony. Thank you. Great, thank you. And I will submit um, a written copy of it um, and apologize for speaking quickly. I just wanted to make sure that Eric had plenty of time because <laughs> I think Eric's great. So <laughs> it's great to see you all. Thank you. Great. Thank you for that. Um, and with that, welcome Eric Sorensen. To get set up here. Am I supposed to have my computer on mute or not on mute? Oh, yes, on yeah. mute. Very mute. much. You can mute your computer and you don't need to have your camera on and okay. you have screen sharing permissions now. Great. Thank you. Uh, hello, uh, it's great to be back here again. I'm Eric Sorensen, uh, an ecologist. Uh, I've retired for two and a half years, enjoying it. I recommend it highly. Uh, um, I worked in the state wetlands office for, oh, six, seven years in the 1990s. And after that, I worked for 25 to 30 years, 27 years in the uh, wildlife division of Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department as an ecologist. Um, working as an ecologist, my uh, work was um, primarily uh, conducting inventories of natural communities and rare species, plants and animals around the states, which was really fun. I kind of missed that part. Uh, and uh, But also doing uh, work, including uh, regulatory review, uh, wetland rules, but also but primarily Act 250 and Section 248. And for those, I worked mostly on uh, rare and irreplaceable natural areas, criterion eight. Uh, uh, but then in section 248, there's the ability to review uh, under um, the no undue adverse impact on the natural environment. We were able to also review landscape connectivity and forest fragmentation, which is not an available criteria in Act 250. So uh, let me see. You. And then the other part of my background is I was one of the authors for the Vermont Conservation Design, which I think is uh, an important tool for, for a, lot of, a lot of the work that we're working on. Um, I wanted to offer my congratulations to the chair and to the committee for passage of Act 59. Uh, I, I know a lot of the leadership for that came from here. And I, I just wanted to say, I think that's a landmark uh, piece of legislation for conservation in Vermont. Um, as is uh, the work on Act 250, uh, I listened to Peggy Elmer yesterday, who I've known for a long time, and I thought her testimony was uh, both uh, persuasive, but heartfelt, and a really good retrospective on, uh, on Vermont and our history. And to some extent, our uh, green image that is, I'm worried about not just the image, but what that means in terms of uh, land protection in the state. Um, that's it. Uh, so what I wanted to cover uh, is habitat loss and fragmentation, just a very quick review. You've heard a lot about it. Another very quick review about Vermont conservation design, since that's a framework I can I come with. And uh, just to, to remind you, I think I've, I've presented that to you before. And then I wanted to, to discuss uh, issues relating to tier two and tier three in um, Act 250 review. Uh, I'm uh, unaffiliated with any organization now, so uh, I haven't had the benefit of reviewing 
comments I have with say with the agency of natural resources or or others, just with a few uh, close colleagues. Um, so what I say is my opinion and maybe blunt, uh, but I I hope it's helpful and I would sure help be happy to be proved wrong if any of my comments aren't on spot on. So uh, Vermont's really still amazing place in terms of the amount of features, natural features that we have uh, and the opportunity we have to conserve biological diversity in the state. Um, we have lots of forests. I heard a new number the other day, 76% and in uh, testimony yesterday. Lots of limey bedrock, calcium rich bedrock that's important for rare species. Topography, uh, a relatively low human population, which is good for environmental reasons, um, and a culture that's interested in wildlife and, uh, and the sort of the, the space that we have here, the culture. Um, but we also have a lot of roads. And th this is what I want to show you this map is it's an old, it's old data, but the, the point is clear. On the map, green is forests. Yellow is agriculture, red is cities, and blue is lakes and ponds. And if you add in roads, you get that image. And if you add in houses, you get that image. And uh, this is, again, this isn't new, but it's looking at images like this that led us to think that we need to think about forest blocks because the areas that are still green in this and don't show red are the places that are relatively intact forest blocks. They are a feature that's uh, disappearing and becoming fragmented. So that's really what Vermont Conservation Design was for. Uh, it was to come up with a way to maintain this intact, connected and diverse landscape into the future, a way to conserve both common species, rare species and natural communities and provide a landscape that allows for climate uh, adaptation and change over time. Um, there have been some really important recent changes to Vermont conservation design, especially in terms of mapping forest blocks uh, using new data from uh, actually that uh, Jarlith, who I understand we lost recently, worked on uh, at UVM. And I'd really encourage you to get Bob Zeno in from Vermont Fish and Wildlife. He's, he's uh, sort of leading that effort. So Vermont conservation design is there. I just wanted to review what the, some of the elements are because they're they're very relevant to tier two and threes. Uh, interior forest blocks, the big forest blocks, connectivity blocks that connect all those blocks, surface waters and riparian areas, especially the, the riparian areas that are wider than the river itself, but encompass the habitat near the river. Uh, physical landscape, which is uh, bedrock and other features like that. Wildlife road crossings that are part of the habitat connectors that connect both between blocks, but also we should think of those as places associated with, with riparian areas. Uh, and all of those features are pretty well mapped. We can always improve the mapping on those. Uh, these other features, uh, terrestrial natural communities, uh, the feature on the left, those are on state lands, on private lands. Uh, I forget how many thousands of rec records there are in the state now, but those are fairly detailed mapping. Uh, special aquatic features like high elevation streams or lower sections of rivers that go into Lake Champlain uh, and then uh, wetlands. Those also are all well mapped. And then features that aren't really mapped but that are important targets, young and old forests. The old forest targets are ones that are addressed also in uh, Act 59 uh, and grasslands. These are important for species for ecological processes and, and many other features. So that's my review of Vermont conservation design. I wanted to go into some more detailed comments about uh, uh, Act 250 and the, the NRB report and uh, H687. I first wanted to say I haven't read all the reports in detail, the three reports from the NRB, but I, my sense is it is an amazing piece of work uh, and, and a huge amount of collaboration. Uh, and it makes me really proud uh, of Vermont that we pull something up like that off in a time like this to collaborate across across disciplines to come up with, a, with plans. Um, 
So uh, first of all, I just want to say I really support the habitat block or forest block and, and connecting habitat criteria. Uh, since I worked at ANR, we've been working on those since 2013 with drafts of some things that are very similar to this. And it's very good to see them in a form that it sounds like there's a lot of our buy-in for. Uh, I don't have any specific concerns about the definitions. I always wish they weren't quite so full of exemptions for forestry and agriculture, but I understand that's, that's important. Um, uh, I do have concerns about the rulemaking process as associated with those criteria in implementing those. Uh, I think some of the rulemaking can uh, get into the weeds too much and make them too, too defined. Uh, I would give necessary wildlife habitat as an example, as something that the agency and Fish and Wildlife have implemented without rulemaking and have developed uh, based on uh, case law and similarly for rare and irreplaceable natural areas. So I'm, I'm, I'm worried about that process and especially about the idea of compensating for forest blocks. We can't continue to lose forest blocks and compensate for them elsewhere. Uh, another concern, and this isn't my business anymore since I don't work there, but I'm worried about from our Fish and Wildlife Department staff with these new criteria and how they will staff up to be able to review all these projects that, that may come in and need a thorough review of these criteria. And currently, there are only two people working on that. Um, and then aside from that, and this is kind of like uh, uh, Charlie having some other, Charlie Hancock having some other ideas, one thing that's worried me about Act 250 for a long time is that under criterion 8A, that is addressing necessary wildlife habitat and endangered species, uh, it, it does not address endangered species, threatened species, or rare species habitat. And that is something that is a, a, a very important part of biological diversity. We can't solve that issue in Act 250, but it's a uh, a glaring miss in our review of projects or review of projects that we can't uh, review active, we can't review rare species. Uh, and I would just add that the Vermont wetland rules does include a, 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 a provision that addresses threatened, endangered, and rare species habitat. So it's it's not something that's unseen in state regulations. It's there in those rules. Um, so sort of going into the tiers, I think the tier two concept is great and that provides an important balance for the for tier one. Um, I haven't reviewed the tier one ideas, but I sure understand why we need that kind of relaxed standards for uh, places where we want growth to occur. Um, as others, I think, have said and is clear from the report and Act uh, 687, I don't think the Tier 2 concept works unless we have uh, new triggers and ju jurisdiction for forest blocks and habitat connectivity. Like that part is really critical to make the Tier 2 effective. Without those sort of business as usual, I think, for what happens in Act 250. So the road rule and lot numbers to me are the are, are what I've focused on. Uh, for the road rule, uh, uh, my image at the bottom is probably similar to what Charlie Hancock showed you, and I've seen many of these. One of my jobs for uh, doing statewide inventories was flying around the state with Ian Worley, a uh, ecologist and professor from UVM to look at potential sites to visit. And it's amazing how many places you see where there is a, a ridgetop development with a road, 1,000, 2,000, 5,000 feet getting to it. Uh, and I worry that as Vermont again and again looks like a wonderful place to live and properties are expensive, but still much cheaper than Colorado or New York, uh, that those places are at risk. Uh, if we don't have a way to address them, even for single family houses. So I, and I, I worry even with the 2000 foot uh, road rule that that allows single roads 
1,999 feet to punch into the middle of a forest block. And multiple examples of those is how we lose habitat, uh, interior forest habitat. So uh, I have no knowledge about what, what can be successful uh, in terms of consensus. I'm not involved in any of that. Just as a biologist and ecologist, I worry about that, that long of a road. Um, my suggestion would be to go back and look again at what was a very successful 800 foot combined, not wasn't combined then, but a combined road and driveway rule or something similar to the 500 or maybe 800 foot setback that's proposed in 687. Another thing I'm worried about is, is partly just what Charlie brought up about what happens in Montgomery, where you have multiple uh, sort of ways of skirting this. So you do a 1,900 foot road and three lots or nine lots, and, and then do another one in a few years. And that kind of development uh, really eats up land quickly, and it does not get the review that I think it needs. Um, I have pretty simplistic uh, images to show you, for examples, but I just wanted to uh, give you a couple. This is over in the Benson uh, Orwell area. It's part of an important landscape connectivity between the Adirondacks and the Green Mountains. And uh, the forest block, does that show? Yeah. This forest block here is about 1,855 acres. It's identified as the highest priority interior forest block and highest priority conductivity block in Vermont conservation design. Um, uh, you can't see the orange color, that's purple and orange are, purple is interior forest and orange is conductivity. Here's a much smaller block that's identified as highest priority con conductivity. This green line in between indicates an area identified as an important wildlife road crossing and uh, what I wanted to point out here is this orange line is a hypothetical 2,000 foot road, and that 2,000 foot road goes uh, pretty much into the center of this, you know, almost 2,000 acre block. And you could picture several of those around that block, and functions of that block are pretty much lost. Um, relating to lot numbers, uh, and all I looked at. I didn't look at the other the triggers that were there, just the number of lots. And uh, again, I really support a, a reduced number of lots. I think the 10 lot uh, uh, number is, is pretty high and just wanted, I'll give you a quick example of that. Uh, but uh, I would suggest something like the four that's proposed. Um, if you, in, the, in that same location, uh, again, the, forest blocks in the two colors, the, the green line along the road indicating wildlife road crossings, those kind of light blue, light blue um, dots are existing houses. And on, this is sort of the existing condition. You can see there are a couple of houses probably with long driveways up into this block, but there's still a you know, good connection across this block here and across this block here. And it's those kind of connections that allow for habitat connectivity to occur. On the right-hand image here, I stuck in uh, not very nicely, but 10 little circles to represent 10 houses. It probably should have been nine to not trigger Act 250 with a, uh, a 10 lot uh, minimum. But what that would do, if these were all five, less than 500 feet from the road, is effectively cut off connectivity between that larger forest block, the purple one, and the and the orange one. So, a ten lot subdivision like that, that was roadside, uh, uh, could be very significant in adverse impact on landscape connectivity. Um, tier three, uh, I think this is a really good concept. I really. I really like it, whether it's tier three or the critical resource areas. I think it's really important for helping to protect ecologically significant areas. I have a couple of concerns, both with what was presented in the report and in H67, H687. First of all, I think there are very few features 
that have high ecological significance and that can be mapped in, in fairly permanent locations and that represent a small area of the state. Uh, uh, a lot of the areas that have high ecological significance, things like forest blocks and uh, landscape conductivity are large areas. And it would be very difficult, I think, to pull out subsections of those and say these are even more important. Because like, like with that conductivity example I showed you, you can't just identify the road. You have to identify the whole blocks that make up the sequence. Otherwise, the whole system falls apart. Um, ecological features of statewide significance, I think, should be mapped at the statewide level for consist consistency with Act 250 jurisdiction. Uh, I think work by RPCs and municipalities are critical for identifying uh, sort of more locally important areas. But uh, one of the things I've seen with Act 171 is that there's been a, a, a quite a bit of variation in how features were identified for, for town planning. And for Act 250 uh, jurisdiction, especially something that pulls everything in like Tier 3 would, I think it's really important for these statewide critical features that they're mapped based on statewide features. Um, I, I haven't followed up a lot on the tier one, but that seems like one where it's the, the opposite is true. Municipalities know what's happening in their, their areas probably more than the state does, even though state review of those seems very important. We have a question from Representative Sebelia. Or sorry. So thanks for your testimony. Um, it's really important to me to understand kind of the decision making process here and the communication process around the proposed change here um, with tier three. And so what I think you're suggesting is this would best be done at the state level and then reviewed by the RPC and the towns. Is that right? I, I think so, but uh, again, I don't. I, I don't feel like I know enough about all the process that's been gone through and suggested. I, I think there are some features that are best mapped at the state level, like Vermont Conservation Design features, if we do that, or or others that I'll mention in a minute. And there are others that state agencies don't know about, and municipalities do, and like they may identify. I don't know, I'll make something up, a waterfall or something like that, as this is a really important feature in the town or uh, an, an area of working forest that, that means so much to the town. So I, I think it should be both ways. And, but I worry about statewide features being mapped at the regional or town level. And in many ways, that makes sense to me, but I, I worry about conflict how that's resolved and how there is community engagement um, at the local level. I don't know if you have any thoughts about that. It's not if you if it's something you're willing to think about. I, I, I don't have more now other than what I've read in the reports is that contemplation of, of strong interaction to come up with plans and maps that are reviewed and understood both from the state and municipal level. Put a finer point on it. I worry about conflict, particularly in communities that are likely to be most impacted um, and probably have the least amount of capacity for engagement or technical assistance. So I'm acutely interested in how that right. would work. Right. Uh, I mean, I know it's not your proposal, but if right. to that point, uh, and what I, I'm worried about with tier three is. If we want this to be a small area of the state, uh, that's what I think. That's what the NRV report suggests that it is. It will be a small area of the state. We have to figure out how to refine it so it really is a small area, or something that is of such critical importance that uh, a larger area is okay. Um, Representative Stebbins, thanks, Madam Chair. Um, thanks for coming in. Sure. I, I, I probably should have mentioned this earlier, but I, I guess I was uh, somewhat dismayed at your highlighting of the 10, but could have been nine houses along the side of the road. Cause I, I feel like the, the goal of the road rule is to try and like put development 
closer to roads that already exist. But when you brought that up, it's like, ah, oh, so really we shouldn't be developing anything for anyone. <laughs> Am I interpreting that correctly? Uh, uh, no. Uh, okay. and, and a suggestion here for those nine lots yeah. is make a cluster. Make a cluster, uh, I, I can point, make a cluster of 10 lots right there. Uh, and you can still maintain connectivity. You can still build the lots. Maybe they're not single family houses. Maybe they're duplexes or quadruplexes or something like that. I, but there are ways to design this so that you avoid either interior forest fragmentation or linear fragmentation by building them all right next to the road. That's helpful. Thank you. I sure don't mean that. I'm glad I asked. <laughs> Representative Bonner. I mean, that, that question, that slide also brings up that the other way to get at that, would, I, I agree with what you said, but the other is that as we're thinking more carefully about maps and identifying resources in areas that we want to be paying attention to with uh, future land use maps, that could also show up there and the regional commissioners would theoretically help the towns make sure they weren't allowing this and be thinking differently. So this, um, uh, my point is that it, if we do this right, it also is happening at the local level and regional level, not just through Act 250 to accomplish what you two are both just talking about at this moment. Uh, my last point on here was just that, uh, I think I might have already said that connecting to habitat and Vermont conservation design features are suggested in, in the report in particular, but these features typically occupy large areas. And they're also uh, like that area of connectivity. Uh, they really require on the ground evaluation to see if they're really functional, uh, to see how they're working. So uh, it, makes, it makes identifying some of those features as automatic inclusion difficult, I think. Um, sort of in the positive side of recommendations for tier th three, I, I think riparian areas or river corridors fit that concept of tier three or critical resource areas really well. Um, uh, they're accurately mapped. Uh, they are in fairly stable locations uh, and they have very high ecological significance. I think maybe more than any other feature I can think of now uh, riparian areas, you know, especially given what's happened recently with flooding, but that side of it, that sort of human side of it apart, um, river process, water quality, aquatic biota, flood attenuation, the floodplain natural communities and all the rare species that are associated with that necessary wildlife habitat. It's not one that Vermont Fish and Wildlife addresses a lot now, but uh, mink, otter, and wood turtle are prime uh, species that are completely tied to this riparian habitat, as well as landscape and wildlife connectivity. Uh, riparian areas are a landscape connectivity feature that is different than those road crossings and block to block because they are linear features already and provide this pathway across the landscape. I, I think there's been some discussion about uh, rip, riparian areas being addressed under Senate Bill 213. Um, I think very highly of the Rivers Program and all the work they do, but to incorporate all these functions that I've listed here under a Rivers Program bill, under a Rivers Program would mean rewriting the Rivers Program so it operates like the Vermont Wetland Rules, where you have a whole set of functions that have to be addressed, or you figure out how to get wildlife and landscape connectivity and those features built into a rivers program. Um, that's all I, I wanted to just mention how uh, many tools we have for conserving an ecologically functional landscape from landowner stewardship, which I still think is the most important thing we have, uh, uh, landowner incentives like current use that help landowners uh, financially in a way that they can make decisions both state and federal and land trust conservation of lands in fee and in easement. 
municipal zoning and planning. And like, uh, I don't picture Act 250 as being a panacea in any sense, but I think it has, uh, it's done a huge amount in terms of what landscape we have now and the status that Vermont has uh, or the status that our landscape has as being so intact. And I think these changes that are contemplated in 687 and in the report will go a long way to, to really improve that. That's all I've got. Thank you for your testimony and for taking the time um, to look at it closely and give us that input. Sure. Do members have questions? Representative Bongard. I have a question. I want to say that I find a lot of this to be really helpful. Uh, it's it's some things that have been rolling around in my head you put your finger on. So thank you. Thanks again for your testimony. Thanks. Great to see you in the building. All right, members, we will take a break for lunch.